Section 10 of Astounding Stories 20, August 1931. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Astounding Stories 20, August 1931. By Harl Vincent. The Moonweed, Part 1. Hobart Madison pursed his lips in a whistle of incredulous surprise as he regarded the object that lay in the palm of his hand. An ordinary pebble, it seemed to be, but a pebble in which a strange fire smoldered and showed itself here and there through the dull surface. "'Would you mind repeating what you just said, Van?' he asked. "'You heard me the first time. I said that that's a diamond, and that it came from the moon.' Carl Vanderventer glared at his friend in resentment of his doubting tone. "'Mean to tell me you've been there? To the moon?' "'Certainly not. I'm not a Jules Verne adventurer. But I'm telling you that stone is a diamond of the first water, and that it came from the moon. Weighs over a hundred carats, too. You can have it appraised yourself if you think I'm kidding you.' Barton Madison laughed. "'Don't get sore, Van,' he said. I'm not doubting your word, but, Lord, man, the thing's so incredible. It takes a little time to soak in. And you say there are more? Sure. This is the largest of five I've found so far. And there's other stuff, too. Wait till you see. Fossils, beetles, and things. I tell you, Bart, the moon was inhabited at one time. I've the evidence, and I want you to be the first to see it. The eyes of the young scientist shone with excitement, as he saw that his friend was roused to intense interest. So that's what all your experimenting had been aimed at? No wonder it cost so much. Yes, and you've been a brick for financing me. Never asked a question, either. But, Bart, it'll all come back to you now. Know how much that stone's worth? Plenty, I guess. But forget about the financing and all that. Where's this laboratory of yours? Madison had pushed his chair back from his desk and was reaching for his hat. "'Over in the Ramapo Mountains, not far from Tuxedo. I'll have you there in two hours. Sure you can spare the time to go out there now?' Vanderventer was enthusiastically eager. "'Spare the time? You just try and keep me from going.' Neither of them noticed the sinister figure that lurked outside the door which led into the adjoining office. They chattered excitedly as they passed into the outer hall and made for the elevator. Vander Venter's laboratory was a small domed structure set in a clearing atop the mountain and well hidden from the winding road which was the only means of approach. Though Bart Madison, who had inherited his father's prosperous brokerage business, had financed his friend's research work ever since the two left college, this was his first visit to the secluded workshop and its wealth of equipment was revealed to him as a complete surprise. He had always thought of Van's experiments as something beyond his ken, something uncanny and mysterious. Now he was convinced. The most prominent single piece of apparatus in the laboratory was a twelve-inch reflecting telescope, which reared its latticed framework to a slit in the dome overhead. Paralleling its axis and secured to the same equatorial mounting, was a shining tube of copper which bristled with handwheels and levers and was connected by heavy insulated cables to an amazing array of electrical machinery that occupied an entire side of the single room. "'Regular young observatory you've got here, Van,' Bart commented when he had taken all this in in one sweeping glance of appraisal. "'Yeah, and then some. Not another like it in the world.' Van was busying himself with the controls of his electrical equipment, and a powerful motor generator started up with a click and a whir as he closed a starting switch. Madison watched in silence as the swift-fingered scientist fussed with the complicated adjustments of the apparatus, and then turned to the massive concrete pedestal on which his telescope was mounted. At his touch of a button, the instrument swung over on its polar axis to a new position. The slit in the dome was open to the afternoon sky, revealing the lunar disk in its daytime faintness. "'You can see it just as well in daylight?' Bart asked as his friend peered through the eyepiece of the telescope and continued his adjustments. "'Sure. 
the surface is just as bright as at night. Doesn't seem so to your eye, but it's different through the telescope. Here, take a look." Bart squinted through the eyepiece and saw a huge crater with a shadowed spire in its center. Like a shell-hole in soft earth it appeared, a great splash that had congealed immediately it was made. The crosshairs of the eyepiece were centered on a small circular shadow near its inner rim. "'That,' Van was saying, "'is a prominent crater near the Mare Nubium. The spot under the crosshairs is that from which I have obtained the diamonds, and other things. Watch this now, Bart.' The young broker straightened up and saw that his friend was removing the cover from a crystal bowl that was attached to the lower end of the copper tube that pointed to the heavens at the same ascension and declination as the telescope. The air of the room vibrated to a strange energy when he closed a switch that lighted a dozen vacuum tubes in the apparatus that lined the wall. "'You say you bring that stuff here with a light ray?' he asked. "'No, I said with the speed of light.' This tube projects a ray of vibrations, like directional radio, you know, and this ray has a component that disintegrates the object it strikes and brings it back to us as dissociated protons and electrons, which are reassembled in the original form and structure in this crystal bowl. Watch. A misty brilliance filled the bowl's interior. Intangible, shadowy forms seemed to be taking shape within a swirling maze of ethereal light that hummed and crackled with astounding vigor. Then, abruptly, the apparatus was silent and the light gone, revealing an odd object that had taken form in the bowl. "'A starfish!' Bart gasped. "'Yeah, and fossilized!' Van handled it to him and he took it in his fingers gingerly, as if expecting it to burn them. The thing was undoubtedly a starfish, and of light, spongy stone. Its color was a pale blue and the ambulacral suckers were clearly discernible on all five rays. "'Lord, you're sure this is from the moon?' Bart turned the starfish over in his hand and gazed stupidly at his friend. "'Certainly, you nut. Think I had it up my sleeve? But here, watch again. There's something else.' The crackling misty light again filled the bowl. "'Suppose,' Bart ventured, "'you bring in something large, big as a house, let's say.' What would it do to your machine? Can't. The rail only pick up stuff that'll enter the bowl. Look, here's the next arrival. The mysterious light died down, and the scientist picked up the second object with trembling fingers. It was a knife of beautiful workmanship, fashioned from obsidian and obviously the work of human hands. There, didn't I tell you? Van gloated. Guess that shows there were living beings on the moon. He made minute changes in the adjustment of his marvelous instrument, and Bart watched in dazed astonishment as object after object materialized before their eyes. There were fragments of strange minerals, more fossils, marine life mostly, a roughly beaten silver plate, three diamonds, none of which was as large as what Van had taken to New York, but all of considerable value. "'This'll be something for the papers, Van.' Bart Madison was visioning the fame that was to come to his friend. Yeah, all but the diamonds. All but the diamonds is right. These words were spoken by a sarcastic voice, chill as an icicle, that came from the open door. They wheeled to look into the muzzles of two automatic pistols that were trained on them by a stocky individual who faced them with a twisted, knowing grin. Danny Kelly! Bart gasped raising his hand slowly to the level of his shoulders. He knew the ex-army captain was a dead shot with a service pistol, and a desperate man since his disgrace and forced resignation. "'What's the big idea?' he demanded. "'You don't need to ask. Refused me alone this morning, didn't you? Now I'm getting it this way.' Kelly turned savagely on Van, prodding his ribs with a pistol. "'Get him up, you!' he snapped. Van had been slow in raising his hands, gaping in stupefied amazement at the intruder. Now he reached for the ceiling without delay. "'You'll serve time for this, Danny,' Bart shouted. "'Shut up! I know what I'm doing. And back up, too. Where? No, the other door.' Kelly was forcing them toward the door of the cellar at the point of one pistol as he kept Van covered with the other. 
Bart clenched his fist and brought it down in a sudden sweeping blow that raked Kelly's cheek and ear with stunning force. But the gunman recovered in a flash, dropped the muzzle of his pistol, and pulled the trigger. Drilled through the thigh, Bart staggered through the open door and fell the length of the stairs into the darkness of the cellar. Kelly laughed evilly as he slammed the door and turned the key. "'Hold it, you!' he snarled as he swung on Van, who had dropped his hands and crouched for a spring. "'If I drill you, it won't be through the leg. I'll take those diamonds now.' He pocketed one of his pistols, and keeping the other pressed to the pit of Van's stomach, went through his pockets. Then he added those on the tray by the crystal bowl to the collection, and transferred the entire lot to his own pocket. "'Now, you clever engineer,' he grinned, "'we'll just operate this trick machine of yours for a while and collect some more. Hop to it.' He watched narrowly as Van stretched his fingers to the controls. "'No monkey business, either,' he grated. "'You'll not change a single adjustment. I've been listening to you, and I know the clock of the telescope is keeping the ray trained on the same spot. You just operate the ray, and nothing else. Get me?' Van did not think it expedient to tell him of the drift caused by inaccuracies in the clock and perturbations of the moon's motion. He was playing for time, trying to plan a course of action. "'There may not be any more diamonds,' he offered as he tripped the release of the ray. "'Oh, there'll be more. Don't try to kid me.' An irregular block of quartz materialized in the bowl and Kelly tossed it to the floor in savage disgust. Then a small diamond, very small, but he pocketed it nevertheless. The next object was a strange one, a dried sea pot about six inches in length and of brilliant red color. The ray had shifted to a new position on the lunar surface. Another and another of the strange legumes followed, one of them bursting open and scattering its contents, bright red like the enclosing pod to rattle over the floor like tiny glass beads. Kelly snorted his disgust. "'Still some sort of vegetation out there,' Van muttered. The eternal scientist in the man could not be downed by a mere hold-up. "'Cut the chatter!' Kelly snarled as the crystal bowl gave up another of the useless pods and still another. He gathered up the evidence of lunar vegetation, a half-dozen of the pods, and threw them through the open doorway with a savage gesture. "'You trying to put one over on me?' he bellowed. How can I? Van retorted mildly. I haven't touched a hand wheel. He was wondering vaguely whether this lunar seed would grow in earthly soil. What sort of a plant it would produce under the new environment? Kelly was becoming nervous now. It seemed that little was to be gained by hanging around this crazy man's laboratory. He had a sizable fortune in rough stones already. The big one alone, when properly cut into smaller stones, would make him independent. Maybe there weren't any more anyway. And the longer he stayed, the greater chance there was of getting caught. The advent of another of the pods decided him. A quick blow with the butt of his pistol stretched Van on the floor and Kelly fled the scene. Bart was pounding furiously on the cellar door when Van first took hazy note of his surroundings. Several uncertain minutes passed before he was able to stagger across the room and release his friend. "'Where is he?' Bart demanded, swaying on his feet and blinking in the sudden light. "'Gone. Socked me and beat it with the diamonds.' Van was mopping the blood from his eyes with a handkerchief. "'Are you hit bad?' he inquired. "'No, just a flesh wound. Hurts like the devil, though. How about yourself?' Bart limped to his side and sighed with relief when he examined his bleeding scalp. "'Not so bad yourself, old man.' Where's your first aid kit? Van was still somewhat dazed and merely pointed to the cabinet. Fine pair we turned out to be, he grumbled after his head had cleared a bit under Bart's vigorous cleansing of the cut on his temple. Here we stood, meek as a couple of lambs, and let that guy get away with murder. Yeah, but those forty-fives made the difference. Ouch! Bart winced as his friend poured some fresh iodine over the wound in his leg. Have a heart, will you? They were startled into silence by a hoarse, strangling scream that came from outside the laboratory. Help! Help! 
someone repeated in a panicky voice, a voice which at once ended on a gurgled note of despair. "'It's Kelly,' Bart whispered. "'He's come back. Something's happened to him.' He started for the open door. "'Wait a minute. It may be a trick to get us outside, where he can pop us off.' "'No, it isn't. For God's sake, look!' Bart had reached the door and was pointing at the ground with shaking forefinger. The entire clearing seemed to be alive with wriggling things, long, rubbery tentacles that crawled along the ground, reaching curling ends high in the air, and had even started climbing the trees at the edge of the clearing. Blood-red they were, and partially transparent in the light of the setting sun. Growing things, attached to their thick ends to swelling mounds of red that seemed anchored to the ground. Translucent stalks rose from the mounds and sprouted huge buds that burst and blossomed into flaming flowers a foot in diameter, then withered and went to seed in a moment of time. But always the weaving tendril shot forth with lightning speed, reaching and feeling their uncanny way along the ground and over tree stumps into the woods. One of them emerged from a hollow stump with its slender end coiled around the tiny body of a chattering gray squirrel. "'The moonflowers!' Van cried. "'What do you mean, moonflowers?' "'Dried seed pods. They came over into the bowl, and Kelly threw them out. Now look at the damn things! They're alive!' Kelly's voice came to them once more from behind the barrier of rapidly growing vegetation. "'Help!' he screeched. I'll give back the diamonds, anything, only get me away from the things." "'Ought to let him get him,' Van growled. Bart shivered. "'Too horrible, Van. Got an axe or anything?' "'There's a hatchet around back. Maybe we can—' But the young broker had scuttled around the corner of the building, and Van looked after him anxiously. The vile red tendrils were reaching for the east wall of the laboratory and he saw that their inner surfaces were covered with tiny suckers, like those on the arms of a devilfish. Carnivorous plants, undoubtedly, these awful, half-animal, half-vegetable things, whose seed had been transported across a quarter million miles of space. Man-eaters, deadly and growing with incredible speed. Even the short-lived flowers were fearsome, as they opened their scarlet pansy-like faces and stared a moment before they folded up and shriveled into the seed-cases, like those that had materialized in the crystal bowl. Then he noticed that the pods were opening and spreading more of the terrible seed. Nothing could stop this weird growth now. It would cover the country like a sea of flaming horror, overcoming and devouring every living thing. Cold fear clutched at Van as he realized the enormity of the calamity that had come to the earth. Bart was skirting the edge of the clearing with a hatchet in his hand, and Van tried to call out to him to warn him. But his voice caught in his throat, and instead he ran to his assistance, circling the spreading menace to get around behind where Kelly was still shouting. Damn Kelly, anyway! This never would have happened if he hadn't come on the scene. Kelly was in the woods wedged into the crotch of a tree and striking wildly at the clutching tendrils with his clubbed pistol. They mashed easily and dripping red, but were not to be deterred from their ghastly purpose. Kelly's time would have indeed been short had not his erstwhile victims come to the rescue. One of the thickest of the twining things encircled his body and had him pinned to the tree. His breath was coming in gasps as its tightening coils increased their pressure. His coarse features were livid, and his eyes bulged from their sockets. Bart hacked and hacked at the rubbery growth, until he had him free, jerked him from his perch, blubbering and whining like a schoolboy. His shirt had been torn from his breast, and they saw a great red welt where the blood had been drawn through the pores by those terrible suckers. "'Look out, Bart!' Van shouted. Another of the creeping things had come through the underbrush and was wrapping its coils around Bart's ankle. Another and another wriggled through, and soon they were battling for their own freedom. Kelly staggered off into the woods and went crashing down the hill, leaving them to take care of themselves as best they might. The stench of the viscous liquid that oozed from the injured tendrils was nauseous. It had something of a soporific effect, and the two friends found themselves fighting the terror in a growing mist of red that blinded and confused them. 
Then, miraculously, they were free, and Van assisted Bart as they ran through the forest. When they reached the road, weak and out of breath, they were just in time to see Kelly's roadster vanish around the bend. "'Yeah, he'd give back the diamonds, the swine,' Van muttered vindictively. Then, shrugging his shoulders, "'Well, they won't be much good to him anyway. They won't be any good to us either, as far as that goes.' "'What do you mean? Aren't they real?' Bart was raising himself painfully into the seat of Van's car, his wounded leg suddenly very much in the way. "'Sure, they're real, but don't you realize what this thing means? This ungodly growth that started?' "'Why, why no. You mean it'll keep on growing? And how? Those inner stalks drop a new batch of seeds every five minutes or so. Presto! A flock of new plants spring up ten feet from the first, dozens of them for every pod that drops. You know how geometrical progression works out. They'll cover the whole country, the whole world. Lord! Man alive, this is terrible. I hadn't thought of that before. What'll we do? Yeah, that's the question. What can we do? Van started his motor and jerked the card to the road. First off, we're going to get away from here, fast. Bart gripped his arm as he shifted into second gear. Look, Van, he babbled, they're out of the woods already, loose. The red snakes are loose from their stalks. They're alive, I tell you. It was true. Several of the slimy red things were wriggling their way over the macadam like great earthworms, but moving with the speed of hurrying pedestrians. Free and untrammeled by the roots and stems of the mother plants, they had set forth on their own in the search for beings of flesh and blood to destroy. Millions of their kind would follow, billions. In sudden panic, Van stepped on the gas. Fifteen minutes later, with shrieking siren, a motorcycle drew alongside and forced them to the curb. "'Where's the fire?' the sarcastic voice of a stern-visaged officer demanded when Van had brought his car to a screeching stop. Seventy-five, the speedometer had read but a moment before. "'It's life and death, officer,' Van started to explain. "'We must get to the proper officials to warn the—' "'Ah, tell it to the judge. Come on now, follow me.' But, officer, there's death on its way from the hills, I tell you. Red, creeping things that'll be here in a couple of hours. Get away from that wheel. I'll drive you in myself. You're full of Applejack. Bart had opened the door on his side and was limping his way around the back of the car. This was serious. They had to get away. Had to spread the word in a way that would be believed before it was too late. The officer was tugging at Van's arm, astonishment and black rage showing in his weather-beaten countenance. Speeding, drunk, resisting an officer, they'd never get out of this mess. A swift uppercut interrupted the proceedings. Bart's leg was numb and stiff, but his good right arm was working smoothly and with all its old-time precision. His second punch was a haymaker. With his full weight behind it, it drove straight to the chin and stretched the officer on the concrete. Thoughtfully, Bart removed his pistol from its holster before scrambling in at Van's side. "'Boy, now we're in for it,' he gasped. "'And we might as well make a good job while we're at it.' Van let in his clutch with a jerk, and again they were breaking all traffic regulations. End of Section 10 Section 11 of Astounding Stories 20, August 1931. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Astounding Stories 20, August 1931. By Harl Vincent. The Moonweed, Part 2. It was dusk when they roared in through the gate at the Rockland County Airport and pulled up at the hangar office. Van rushed in, shouting for Bill Peterson, and Bart followed. A slender, fair-haired youth in rumpled flying togs greeted them. "'Bill, my friend Bart Madison,' Van blurted, without pausing for breath. "'Listen, we've got to have a plane right away. Got one with a radio?' 
Yes, but what's all the rush? Where are you going? Albany, right away. Make it snappy, will you? Sure, but what's it all about? Young Peterson was leading them to the field where a sleek monoplane was in waiting as if they had ordered it. Warm her up, Joe, he called to the mechanic. Listen, Bill, I never lied to you, did I? Van asked when they were seated in the plane's cabin. Not that I know of, but sometimes I've thought you were lying until I saw with my own eyes the things you had told me about. What is it this time? Death and destruction, coming down out of the Ramapos. We've got to warn the country. Plants, Bill, squirmy red plants with long feelers that can twist around a man and devour him. Half animal they are, and the feelers break loose and crawl by themselves, multiplying like nothing you ever saw, millions of them in an hour. What? Peterson stared incredulously as his motor roared into life. Then he gave his attention to the business of taking off. He jerked the thumb of his free hand toward the radio. Van's expert fingers manipulated the switches and dials of the portable apparatus, and its vacuum tubes glowed into life. 2BXX calling 2TIM, he droned into the microphone. Who's that? Bart asked. The drone of the motor was barely audible in the closed cabin and did not interfere. The Times, trying to get Johnny Forbes. If anyone can get this thing across, he can. Wait a minute, here they are. He closed his eyes as he listened to the murmuring voice in the headphones. Then he was talking rapidly, forcefully, and the young flyer gazed with owlish solemnity at Bart as they listened to his conversation. It was plain that Bill was but half inclined to believe, though impressed by the earnestness and evident apprehension displayed by his two passengers. "'Yes, 2BXX,' Van was saying. "'Connect me with Johnny Forbes, please. In a hurry. Yes. Hello, Johnny. It's Van. Carl Vanderventer, you know. Yes, got a scoop for you, but first I want you to get it in the broadcasts. Get me? It's about a man-eating plant that's starting to overrun the country. No, listen now, I'm not dreaming. Listen. The frantic scientist rambled on and on about the seed from the moon, the red death that was creeping down from the mountains, the horror of the calamity as he and Bart had visioned it. Then, with a sudden note of despair, his voice trailed off into nothingness, and he turned a drawn white face to his two friends. Laughed at me. Hung up on me he groaned. Good God, we've got to do something, quick! Be in Albany in an hour, the pilot suggested. What are you going to do there? He believed now. His expression of horror showed it. See the governor. But man, it's an hour wasted. We must stir up the country, uh, get the word to Washington, everywhere. It might be possible to fight the thing some way if we can mobilize state and national resources quickly enough. Bill, Bart, what can we do? The plane sped on through the night under control of her gyro pilot as the three men racked their brains for a solution of the problem. If a hard-boiled newspaper man would not believe the story, who could? I've got it, Bart shouted suddenly. Can either of you pound a key? Code, I mean? Sure, I can. Then what? Peterson returned. Fake an SOS. Don't you see? All broadcasting has to stop, and every ship at sea, every airliner in this part of the country will be listening, standing by. Give them the story in code. Let them think we're in a ship from the moon, captured by Lunarians who are here to destroy the world with this weed of theirs, anything. Make it as weird as possible. Most everyone will think it's a hoax, but there are ten thousand kids, amateurs, who'll be listening in. Somebody will believe it. And believe me, there'll be some investigating in the neighborhood of the growth in no time. By George, I believe that'll do it, Van exclaimed. And the broadcasters listen in for an SOS themselves. Got to, you know, so they know when to start up again. Some smart announcer will tell the story, maybe even believe it. The trick will work, sure as shooting. The pilot glanced at his instruments and saw that the automatic gyro apparatus was functioning properly. Then he moved over to the radio and threw the switch that put the key in circuit instead of the microphone. Rapidly, he ticked off three dots, three dashes, and again three dots that spelled the dread danger signal of the air. Over and over he repeated the signal, 
and then he listened for results. It worked, he gloated after a moment. They're all signing off, the broadcasters. The Navy Yard in Brooklyn gives me the go-ahead. He pounded out the absurd message with swift fingers, pausing occasionally to ask a pertinent question of Van or Bart. At Van's request, he added a warning to all residents of New York State west of the Hudson River and of northern New Jersey to flee their homes without delay. He even asked that the message be relayed to the governors of the two states, and that Governor Perkins of New York be advised that they were on their way to Albany to discuss the situation. But he balked at the story of the Lunarians, telling instead the equally strange truth regarding the origin of the deadly growth, and adding the names of Van and Bart to lend authenticity to the tale. Then he signed off and switched the radio receiver to the loudspeaker before returning to the pilot seat. Bart tuned in on the various broadcasters as they resumed their programs, finally settling on W.O.R. Newark, whose announcer was reading the strange message to his radio public with appropriate comment. A crime and an outrage, he called it, an affront to the industry and to the public, an insult to the government of the United States. But wait! A telephone call had just been received at the station from the village of Slotesburg. A reputable citizen of that town had reported the red growth at the edge of the state road, huge red earthworms wriggling across the concrete. Another call, and another. The announcer's voice was rising hysterically. "'It did work, Bart!' Van exulted. "'Now the hell starts popping!' Governor Perkins met them in person when they arrived at the municipal airport in Albany. A great crowd had gathered in the shadows outside in the brilliance of the floodlights, and a police escort rushed them to the governor's private car. "'Here's where you go to the Bastille for socking that cop,' Van observed. His spirits had risen appreciably since that successful S.O.S. call. But the governor was in a serious mood as they made their way toward the executive mansion through the milling crowds that lined the hilly streets of the capital city of New York State. Proofs had not been lacking of the truth of Bill Peterson's radio warning. Already the spreading red death had covered a circle some eight miles in diameter, covering farmlands and destroying the crops, blocking the roads and trapping many on the streets and in their homes and in nearby towns. More than a hundred had lost their lives, and thousands were fleeing the threatened area. The country was in an uproar. Gentlemen, the governor said when they had reached the privacy of his chambers, this is a serious matter, and no time must be lost in dealing with it. Nevertheless, I want you, Mr. Vanderventer, to tell your story of the thing to me and to the radio system of the United States Secret Service. The President himself will be listening, as will the chief executives of most of the states. Hold nothing back, as the fate of our people is at stake." So Van faced the microphone and related the history of his work in the little laboratory in the Romapo Mountains. He told of his interest in the Earth's satellite, and of his first unsuccessful experiments with ultra-telescopes in the endeavor to explore its surface close at hand, of the failure of a spaceship he had built of the final discovery of the ray, by means of which it was possible to transport solid objects from the one body to the other. He told of the discovery of man-made relics and of fossils. He told of the diamonds, and of the attack by Dan Kelly, which had resulted in the spreading of the seed of the deadly moonweed. He even related the incident of a traffic policeman, at which the governor smiled. "'That has been reported,' he said and you need have no fear on that score. The charges will be dropped. I now ask that you give us your opinion as to the best method of combating this new enemy. Have you any ideas?" I have not, sir, Van replied gloomily, though I believe it can be done only from the air. Possibly bombing, or a gas of some sort, I don't know. It will take time, Mr. Governor. Yes, and meanwhile the thing is overwhelming us at what rate? As nearly as I can estimate it, the growth is moving with a speed of four or five miles an hour. By morning you can expect it will have traveled forty or fifty miles in all directions? I'm afraid so." A sharp buzz from the instrument on the governor's desk interrupted them. "'The President,' he whispered. "'That is enough, Governor,' came the husky tones of President Alfred's voice. "'I shall communicate with Secretary Makeley at once all available army bombing planes will be rushed to the scene. 
you, sir, will mobilize the militia, as will the governors of the other states. Meanwhile, this young scientist is to report to the Bureau of Scientific Research in Washington tonight. Have him bring a supply of these seeds with him." That was all. Governor Perkins offered no comment, but merely rose from his seat to indicate that the discussion was ended. A solemn silence reigned in the room. "'Let's go!' exclaimed Bill Peterson suddenly, unawed by the presence of the governor. "'My ship's waiting, and we can stop off for a couple of those pods and still make Washington in two hours. Come on!' Governor Perkins smiled. "'Good luck, boys,' he said, as they were ushered from the room. "'My car will return you to the airport. And remember, the country will be watching you now and expecting much from you. Goodbye." They were to recall his words in the dark days ahead. Before they had reached Newburgh, they saw a dull red glow in the skies that told them the news broadcast to which they had been listening had not exaggerated. The red growth was luminous in darkness. Off there to the southwest, it was as if a vast forest fire were lighting the heavens. No wonder the panics and rioting were getting out of control of the police. Coming up over Bear Mountain, they caught their first glimpse of the sea of fire that was the Red Death by night. Like a vast bed of glowing embers, it covered the countryside, extending eastward to Haverstraw, where it was temporarily halted by the broad Hudson. It was a shimmering, undulating mass of living, luminous things, eating their horrible way through all organic matter that stood in their path. Writhing, squirming, all-absorbing monsters that sent out an advance guard of independent snake-like tendrils to capture and hold for the lagging mother-plants whatever of livestock and humanity they were able to find. "'Think they'll get over the river, Van?' Bart asked. "'Sure they will. Every fugitive who had a narrow escape after being in contact with these things is a potential carrier of the seed. I found several of them sticking to my clothing after we got away. I picked a couple off your coat, but didn't tell you. Lord, what did you do with them? Put them in the ash receiver in my car, like a fool. Wouldn't have to go down for more if I'd kept them. Well, it can't be helped now. We'll have a job getting some down there now, too. I'll say so. Van lapsed into gloomy silence. They were over the landing field above Tompkins Cove, and Bill turned on the siren, whose raucous shriek operated the mechanism of the floodlight switches by sound vibrations. The field sprang into instant illumination, and they circled at once before swooping to a landing. They were but a mile from the advancing terror. The field was deserted, and the three men started off immediately in the direction of the oncoming weed. "'We'll have to make it snappy,' Van grunted. We've got about twelve minutes to get the pods and get back to the ship. The damn things will be here by that time." They scrambled over fences and pushed through thickets. The lighted windows of a deserted farmhouse were directly ahead, and they ran through the open gate and across the fields. Ever the glow of the wee grew brighter. A terrified horse galloped wildly past them and crashed into the fence, whinnying piteously as it went down with a broken leg. They could see the red rim of the advancing horror just beyond the road. One of the detached tendrils slithered past, each glowing coil distinctly visible. "'Lucky the things can't see,' Bart shuddered. "'Yeah,' said Van. "'Have to dodge him to get in close enough to one of the plants. Keep your eyes peeled now, you fellows, in case one of us gets caught.' A terrific explosion rocked the ground. They had paid no heed to the roaring of motors overhead. The bombers were on the job. Shooting skyward, a column of flame not a hundred yards from them showed where the high explosive had landed in the red mass. Then slimy wriggling things rained all about them, fragments of the red weed that still squirmed and crawled and clung. Bill Peterson yelled and clutched at his neck where one of the things had taken hold. Another warning whistle of a falling bomb crash! More of the horror raining down and splattering as it fell. Whistle! Crash! A huge blob of quivering, luminous jelly fell before them, a portion of one of the mother plants. Crash! Crash! Run! Van shouted. Run for the plane! We'll never make it now! Damn those bombers anyway! All along the advancing front the bombs were bursting, 
shattering the air with their detonations and scattering the glowing red stems and tendrils in all directions. The din was appalling, and the increasing brightness of the crimson glow added to the horror of the situation. Stumbling and cursing, they ran for the plain. "'Fools! Fools!' Bill was shouting. "'Can't they see the field and the plain? Why in the devil are they dropping them so near?' Then Bart was down, clawing at a three-foot length of red tendril that had fallen on him and borne him to the earth. "'Bart! Bart!' Van turned back and was tearing at the thing with fingers that were slippery with the sap that oozed from its torn skin. Monstrous earthworms, cut them apart and each portion lived on, took on new vigor. And these vile things could sting like a jellyfish. Where each sucker touched the skin a burning sore remained. Bill helped them break away from the thing, and all three fought on toward the lights of the landing field. Only a short way off now. It seemed they would never reach it. The bombers were dropping their missiles with unceasing regularity, and the red death only spread the faster. When they scrambled into the cabin of the plane, the red wall of creeping horror was almost upon them. Advancing speedily out from the red-lit darkness, it seemed to halt momentarily when it emerged into the brilliance of the great arc-lights which illuminated the field. Then, more slowly and with seemingly purposeful deliberation, the wriggling feelers reached out from the mass and bore down upon them. Bill slammed the door and latched it, then fumbled frantically with the starter switch. A most welcome sound was the answering roar of the motor. The pilot yanked his ship into the air taking off with the wind rather than running the risk of remaining on the ground long enough to taxi around and head into it. The plane acted like a frightened bird as Bill struggled with the controls, darting this way and that, and once missing a crash by inches as the tail was lifted by the treacherous ground wind. Then they were clear, and slowly gained altitude in a steep climb. "'Phew!' Van exclaimed, mopping his red-splattered forehead with his handkerchief. That was a narrow squeak, boys, and we haven't got the seeds yet, unless we can find a few in our clothing. Who said so? Bart gloated. Look at this. He opened his clenched fist and disclosed one of the pods, unbroken and gleaming horribly scarlet in the dim light of the cabin. Bill heaved a sigh of relief as he banked the ship and swung around toward the south. He had dreaded another landing near the Sea of Moonweed. Van chortled over their good fortune as he examined the mysterious pod. One good thing the bombers had done, anyway. Blew one of these things into his friend's hands. Bart and the young pilot found themselves very much out of the picture when they reported with Van at the research building in Washington. The government had no use for them in this emergency. It was the scientist they wanted, and he was immediately rushed into conference with the heads of the Bureau. His two friends were left to shift for themselves, and they joined the crowds in the street. The name of Carl Vanderventer was on everyone's tongue. Cursing and reviling him they were, for the hare-brained experiment which had been the cause of the terrible disaster. Fools! Bart seethed with rage and nearly came to blows with a number of vociferous agitators who were advocating a necktie party. Why hadn't the officials published the entire story as Van told it over the Secret Service radio? There was no mention of Dan Kelly in the broadcast news, nor of the fact that the police were searching for him in every city and town in the country. Another instance of the results of secrecy in governmental activities. "'We'd better find ourselves a room and turn in,' Bart growled. "'Let's get out of this mob before I slam somebody.' Bill Peterson was only too willing. He was suddenly very tired. In the Willard Hotel they were assigned to an excellent room and Bart insisted on switching on the broadcasts and listening to the news. Far into the night he sat by the loudspeaker, or paced the floor as an exceptionally calamitous happening was reported. But Bill slept through it all. The army bombers had been recalled. Their efforts had worked more harm than good. The invincible moonweed had now crossed the Hudson River at Nyack and Piermont. Terrytown was overrun, and many of the inhabitants had lost their lives, either in the maws of the insatiable monsters, or in the panics and rioting that accompanied the evacuation of the town. New Jersey was covered as far south as New Brunswick, and west to Phillipsburg and Belvedere. At Mach Chunk the contents of twenty oil tanks had been diverted to the Delaware River, 
and the floating oil film was proving at least a temporary protection to a considerable portion of the state of Pennsylvania. In New York State the growth had buried hill and valley, town and village, as far as Monticello, and along the Hudson extended as far north as Kingston. At Poughkeepsie, on the opposite side of the river, frantic householders had armed themselves with rifles and shotguns, and were killing off all refugees who attempted to land from boats at that point. But the militia was on guard at the bridges, assuring safe crossing to the thousands who fled the Red Death over these routes. There was no keeping the seed of the moonweed from finding its way east. At some points, fire had been used with considerable success as a barrier, hundreds of acres of forest lands being destroyed in the endeavor to stem the crimson tide. But after the ashes were cool, germination would recur, and the weed would continue on its triumphant way. Acid sprays and poison gas of various kinds had been tried without appreciable effect. The casualty estimates already ran into the tens of thousands. Rumor had it that nearly one hundred thousand had lost their lives in the city of Newark alone. There was no way in which the figures could be checked while everything was in a state of confusion. Communication lines were broken, roads blocked, gas and electric supply systems paralyzed, and the railroads helpless. Trains could not be driven through the glutinous, wriggling mass that piled high on the tracks. Only the radio and the airlines were operative in the stricken area, and even these were of little value to the unfortunates who, in many cases, were surrounded and cut off from all hope of succor. At four in the morning, with aching heart and reeling brain, Bart threw himself on the bed without undressing and fell into the troubled sleep of exhaustion and despair. End of section 11 Section 12 of Astounding Stories 20, August 1931. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Astounding Stories 20, August 1931. The Moonweed by Harl Vincent, Part 3. The next day brought no encouragement though it was reported that the growth developed with less rapidity after sunrise than it had during the night. Bard endeavored to get Van on the telephone, but was curtly informed by the operator at the research building that no incoming calls could be transferred to the laboratory where he was working. Knowing his friend, he pictured him as working feverishly with the government engineers and giving no thought to sleep or food. He'd kill himself, sure but such a death even was preferable to the red one of the moonweed. The Canadians and Mexicans had been quick to protect their borders and forbid the landing of any American aircraft or the passage of trains and automobiles. But the seat had reached Europe, one of the twelve-hour night airliners having carried a thousand refugees who had sufficient foresight and the means to engage passage. It was a world catastrophe they faced. By mid-afternoon the streets of Washington were almost deserted. It was less than twenty-four hours since the first moon seed took root, and already the crimson growth had progressed nearly a hundred miles southward from the point of origin. Another twenty or thirty hours and it would reach the capital city, unless Van and those engineers over in the research building discovered something, a miracle. Bart tried the telephone once more, and was overjoyed when the operator, all apologies now, informed him that Van had been trying to reach him for several hours. Listen, old man, his friend's voice came over the wire. I've been worried as the devil not knowing where you were. I want you and Bill to stick around where I can get you at any time. I may need you. Where are you staying? The Willard. Have you doped out something? Bart answered in quick excitement. Maybe. Can't let anything out yet. Not till we've tested it thoroughly. But I can tell you that a hundred factories are already working on machines we've devised. By good luck, it only means minor changes to an apparatus that is on the market in large quantity. Great stuff! The city's nearly emptied itself, you know, and boy, how have they been razzing you over the radio and in the papers, howling for your hide, the whole country. I know. Van's voice was calm, but Bart sensed in it something of a cold fury that was new to him in his friend. 
the young scientist was bitterly resentful of the attitude of the public. "'Can we see you, Van? No, nor call me either. Better hang around the hotel and wait for a call from me. So long now, Bart. I've got to get busy. So long.' Bart gazed solemnly at Bill Peterson, who had been listening abstractedly to the one-sided conversation. Bill had given up hope and was resigned to the inevitable. "'Says he may need us, Bill,' said Bart. "'Yeah? Well, we'll be ready for anything he wants us to do. It's no use, though, anything.' "'What do you mean, no use? You never saw Van Licht yet, did you?' "'Sure I did. By his super-telescopes and the rocket ship. But this is different.' Bart was a staunch defender of his friend. He glared at Bill for a moment and then switched on the news broadcast which he knew he detested. The progress of the moonweed continued unabated. In the city of New York a million souls were reported as having lost their lives, and this in spite of the difficulty experienced by the uncanny moonweed in obtaining a foothold in Manhattan. It had been thought that the asphalt and concrete would prove an effective barrier, and so they did for a time but, with the seed active in the parks and along the waterfronts, it was not long before the powerful roots of the greedy plants worked their way underneath, ripping up pavements and wriggling into cellars as they progressed. The city was a mass of wreckage and a maelstrom of fighting, dying humanity. Whole regiments of the National Guard were wiped out as they fought off the weed with axe and bayonet, in the effort to provide time for the refugees to clear from their homes in certain localities. All transportation facilities to the south and west were taxed to the utmost. There was fighting and killing for the possession of automobiles and planes and for room in trains and buses. Airline terminals and railroad stations were the scenes of dreadful massacres as the police and military guards fought off the crazed and desperate creatures who attacked them en masse. And still the news announcers prated of the responsibility of one Carl Vanderventer. The telephone bell rang and Bart answered it for relief. At last they were to see some action. But no, it was merely the desk clerk, notifying him that all employees were leaving the hotel and that they would be left to shift for themselves. Yes, there was plenty of food in the kitchens. They were welcome to it. And a permanent telephone connection would be made to their room. The frightened clerk wished them luck. In endless monotone the voice of the news announcer droned on. Binghamton and Elmira, Albany and Schenectady. New Haven, Philadelphia, Allentown, all had succumbed. The casualty estimates now ran into the millions. The mist, the red mist that rose from the steaming weed, was drifting westward and spreading the seed with ever-increasing rapidity. For now the monstrous growth from out the sky was adapting itself to its environment, providing the seed with feathery tufts that permitted the winds to carry them far and wide, like the seed of a dandelion. "'Turn off that damn thing!' Bill shouted, and he jumped to his feet, his eyes glinting strangely in the twilight gloom of the room. Bill was close to the breaking point. "'Guess you're right,' Bart mumbled. "'No good for either of us to listen to that stuff.' He switched off the receiver, and they sat in silence as darkness fell over the city. Bill shivered and felt for the button of the electric light which he pressed with a trembling finger. They blinked in the sudden illumination but it cheered them somewhat. It was not good to sit in the darkness and think. Besides, they knew that the turbine generators of Potomac Edison were still running. Some brave souls were sticking to their jobs, for a time at least. "'God!' Bill suddenly groaned, after an endless time of dead silence. "'My sister lives in Pittsburgh, you know. Wonder if she and the kids got away. It won't be long before the damn stuff gets there.' Bart thanked his lucky stars that he had no family ties. Oh, they had plenty of warning, he tried to console Bill. Ours, you know, and the westbound lines are in good shape from there. I wouldn't worry about them if I were you. There was utter silence once more. Even the customary street noises was lacking. Both men jumped nervously when the shrill siren of a police motorcycle sounded in the distance. Bart thought grimly of his fracas with the officer who had tried to arrest Van. How long ago that seemed, and how inconsequential an incident! Their windows faced north, and by midnight they could make out the red glow of the moonweed, that awful band of flickering crimson that painted the horizon the color of blood. 
The telephone clamored for attention, and Bill stifled a hysterical sob as the terrifying sound broke the eerie stillness. Van was on the way to get them. He had a government car, and they were to go to Arlington for Bill's plane. Then what? He refused to commit himself. They must follow him blindly. Anything was better than this inactivity, though. Bart shouted with glee. "'We're going north,' Van replied shortly in answer to Bart's question when they entered the official car in front of the hotel. "'After Dan Kelly.' "'After Dan Kelly? Got a line on him?' "'Yes. Secret Service reports him in Toronto. The Canucks are after him now, but, by God, I'm going to get him myself.' Van was haggard and wan, his eyes gleaming with a fanatical light. The strain had done something to him, something Bart didn't like at all. This was a different van from the man who had entered his office two days previously. Unshaven and unkempt, he looked and talked like a drunken man on the verge of delirium tremens. "'What's the idea, Van?' he asked gently. "'I'm going to get him. I tell you, the scum. It's his fault the whole world's against me. I'll get him, Bart. I'll kill him with my bare hands.' So that was it. The combination of grueling labor in the effort to save mankind from the dread moonweed and bitter censure from the very people he was trying to save had been too much for Van. He had developed a fixation, unreasoning and murderous. He'd get even with the man who had caused the trouble, and nothing could deter him from his purpose. Bart could see that. Might as well humor him and help him. It made little difference, anyway, with the red doom spreading at its present rate. They'd all be victims in a few days. They were speeding through the streets of Washington at a breakneck rate. Van bent over the wheel, and like a demented man glued his wildly staring eyes to the road. "'What about your work?' Bart asked after a while. "'Has anything been accomplished?' "'Yes and no. They'll be ready to shoot in a few hours. Don't know whether it'll be a complete success or not. But I sneaked away anyhow. This other thing's more important to me right now." "'What's the dope? Can you tell us now?' "'Sure. I've got one of the machines in the car, and I'll explain when we're on our way to Canada.' This wasn't like Van. Never secretive and always in good humor, he was treating his friends like annoying strangers. "'You can't land in Canada,' Bill ventured, as they pulled up at the gate of the airport. "'Like hell I can't. You watch my smoke.' and let any bloody Canuck up there try and stop me." He was lifting a small black case from the luggage carrier of the car as he replied. Bart silenced the airman with a look. When they had taken off and were well under way, Van opened his black case and set a vacuum tube apparatus in operation. They were nearing the fringe of the glowing sea of red that was the vast blanket of moonweed. It now extended to within a few miles of Baltimore and stretched northward as far as the eye could see. It was a cinch, Van was explaining. When I first saw that the growth slowed up under the arc lights at Tompkins Cave, it gave me the glimmering of an idea. Then, on the following day, when we learned that the weed spread more slowly in sunlight, I was convinced. The stuff is dormant on the moon, you know. Why? Bart asked breathlessly. Because there is no atmosphere surrounding the moon, and the sun's rays are not filtered before they reach its surface as they are here. The invisible rays, ultraviolet and such, are present at full proportion, and the moonweed cannot flourish when subjected to light of the higher frequencies. It died out when the moon lost its atmosphere, and only revived on being brought to earth, probably a million times more prolific in our dense and damp atmosphere and rich soil. The thing's a cinch to dope out." Yeah, Bart commented dryly. Van was now talking, and he could have bitten off his tongue for interrupting him. This machine of Van's was a generator of invisible light in the ultra-indigo range, Van explained. You couldn't see its powerful beam, but they had proved in the laboratory that it was certain doom to the moonweed. They had grown the stuff from seed in steel cages, and played with it until they were all satisfied. Now would come the final test. Ten thousand planes were being equipped with the new generator, which was merely an adaptation of standard directional television transmitters, and tonight these would start out to fight the weed. It was a cinch. Beneath them the red cauldrons seethed and tossed as they sped northward. The crimson blanket of death was steadily covering the country. "'Drop to a thousand feet, Bill,' the scientist called, 
and then watch below. But don't slow down. We've got to get to Toronto." The ship nosed down and soon leveled off at the prescribed altitude. Van's vacuum tubes lighted to full brilliancy, and a black spot appeared on the glowing surface just beneath them, a black spot that extended into a streak as the plane continued on its way. They were cutting a swath of blackness fifty feet wide through the heart of the growth. "'See that?' Van gloated. "'It's killing them by the millions! And the best of it is the effect it leaves behind. The soil is permeated to a depth of several inches, and the stuff will not germinate in the spots where the ray has contacted. Oh, it works to perfection!" Bill was exuberant. His hopes revived miraculously. He gave his motor the gun and got out of it every last revolution that it could turn up. He must get Van to Canada. Not such a bad idea, this going after Kelly at that. Bart was voluble in his praise, then caught himself short as he remembered that he had doubted Van but a half-hour previously, doubted him and despaired. Now Van, lapsing into gloomy silence after his triumph, was again thinking of nothing but revenge. The getting of Dan Kelly meant more to him now than the extinction of the moonweed. When they landed at the Toronto airport they were welcomed with open arms instead of with rifle fire as Bill had anticipated. The news had gone forth. Already a thousand planes flying over the United States were driving back the sea of destruction. The invisible ray was a success, and the name of Carl Vanderventer was now a thing with which to conjure, rather than one on which to heap imprecation and insult. Van grimaced wryly at this last bit of news. Dan Kelly? No one at the airport had ever heard of him. Van telephoned into the city, to police headquarters. Yes, they had apprehended the fugitive American at the request of Washington, but he was a slippery customer. He had escaped. Van raged and fumed. Of what use were the congratulations of the night flyers who still loitered in the hangar? Of what consolation the radio reports of the success of the ultra indigo ray in the States and in Europe? He had come after his man, and he'd failed. Defeat was a bitter pill. The news broadcasts from the States were jubilant and became increasingly so during the night. The moonweed was being driven back on a wide front and by morning would be entirely surrounded. There would be no further loss of life and little more destruction of property. Carl Vanderventer had saved the day. Van grunted his disgust whenever an announcer mentioned his name. When daylight came they prepared to return. Little use there was of searching the highways and byways of Canada for the fugitive. He'd simply have to wait until the Canadians were able to get a line on Dan Kelly again. It was maddening. But Bart was glad. The light of reason was returning to his friend's eyes in the reaction. Then there was a telephone call from the city for Van. Police headquarters wanted him. The fanatical glint returned to his eyes when he ran for the hangar to answer the call. Perhaps they had already captured Kelly. And he had an order in his pocket for the man's return to the States. He had been made a deputy and with Kelly released to him anything might happen. Something would happen. But the police were reporting the unexplainable reappearance of the moonweed just outside the city limits at a point near Cooksville. Would Mr. Vanderventer be so kind as to fly over there and destroy it before any lives were lost? He would. The growth had covered an acre of ground by the time they reached the spot designated. But it was the work of only a minute to blast it out of existence with the ultra-indigo ray. Van surveyed the blackened and shriveled mass with satisfaction. "'Let's land and take a look at it,' he said. Bart thought he saw a look of exultation flash over his careworn features. Soon they were wading deep in the blackened remains of the moonweed. The stems and tendrils snapped and crumbled into powder as they passed through. The stuff was done for, no question of that. Bill Peterson yelled and pointed a shaking forefinger at an object that lay in the blackened ruin. It was a human skeleton, the bones bare of flesh and gleaming white in the light of the early morning sun. Van was on his knees quick as a flash, feeling around the gruesome thing, pawing at the shreds of clothing that remained. Then he was on his feet, his face shining with unholy glee. In his hands were a half-dozen small, smooth objects which looked like pebbles. The diamonds. "'I thought so!' he exclaimed. "'It's Kelly!' Only way the seed could have gotten up here. 
he had some on his clothes and didn't know it. I couldn't get him myself, but anyway, I'm satisfied." He staggered and would have fallen had not Bart caught him in his arms. Poor old Van, nearly killed him, this thing had, but he'd be himself again after it was all over. No wonder he'd gone out of his head with the horror of it and the blame that had been so cruelly laid on him. No wonder he'd become obsessed with this idea of getting square with Dan Kelly. But now he was content, sleeping like a babe in Bart's arms. Tenderly they carried him to the plane and laid him out on the cushions in back. They'd let him sleep as long as he could, returned him to Washington, where he'd receive his just dues in recognition for his services. Then would follow the work of reconstruction and rehabilitation. Van would glory in that. Bart regarded his sleeping friend thoughtfully as they winged their swift way toward the American border. The harsh lines that had showed in his face during the past few hours were smoothed away and in their place was an expression of deep contentment. He was at peace with the world once more. Good old Van! What a difference there would be when he awakened to full realization of the changed order of things! What a satisfaction and relief! End of section 12「Section 13 of Astounding Stories 20, August 1931. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording done by Jules Harlock of Mississauga, Ontario, Canada. Astounding Stories, 20, August 1931 The Port of Missing Plains by Captain S. P. Meek Part 1 So that's the Port of Missing Plains, mused Dick Purdy as he looked down over the side of his cockpit. It looks wild and desolate, all right, but at that I can't fancy a bus cracking up here and not being found pronto. Gosh! Wilder crashed in the wildest part of Arizona, and he was found in a week. The mail plane droned monotonously on through perfect flying weather. Purdy continued to study the ground. Recently transferred from a western run, he was getting his first glimpse of that section of ill repute. Below him stretched a desolate, almost uninhabited stretch of country. By looking back, he could see Belfonte a few miles behind him, but Phillipsburg, the next spot marked on his map, was not yet visible. Twelve hundred feet below him ran a silver line of water, which his map told him was Little Mushannon Run. As he watched, he suddenly realized that the ground was not slipping by under him as rapidly as it should. He glanced at his airspeed meter. What the dickens, he cried in surprise. For an hour his speed had remained almost constant at one hundred miles an hour. Without apparent cause it had dropped to forty, less than flying speed. He realized that he was falling. A glance at his altimeter confirmed the impression. The needle had dropped four hundred feet and was slowly moving towards sea level. With an exclamation of alarm, Purdy advanced his throttle until the three motors of his plane roared at full capacity. For a moment his airspeed picked up, but the gain was only momentary. As he watched, the meter dropped to zero, although the propeller still whirled at top speed. His altimeter showed that he was gradually losing elevation. He stood up and looked over the side of his plane. The ground below him was stationary as far forward progress was concerned, but it was slowly rising to meet him. He fumbled at the release ring of his parachute, but another glance at the ground made him hesitate. It was not more than three hundred feet below him. I must be dreaming, he cried. The ground was no longer stationary. For some unexplained reason he was going backward. 
the motors were still roaring at top speed purdy dropped back into his seat in the cockpit with his ailerons set for maximum lift he coaxed every possible revolution from his laboring motors for several minutes he strained at the controls before he cast a quick glance over the side his backward speed had accelerated and the ground was less than fifty feet below him it was too close for a parachute jump as soon as i'm falling i won't crack much anyway he consoled himself he reached for his switch and the roar of the motors died away in silence the plane gave a sickening lurch backward and down for an instant purdy again leaned over the side he was no longer going either forward or back but was sinking slowly down he looked at the ground directly under him a cry of horror came from his lips he sat back moping his brow another glance over the side brought an expression of terror to his white face and he reached for the heavy automatic pistol which hung by the side of the control seat he cleared belafonte at nine in the morning dr birds said inspector dolan of the post office department and headed towards phillipsburg he never arrived by ten we were alarmed and by eleven we had planes out searching for him they reported nothing he must have come to grief within a rather restricted area so we sent search parties out at once that was two weeks ago yesterday no trace of either him or his plane has been found the flying conditions were good perfect also purdy is above suspicion he has been flying the mail on the western runs for three years this is his first accident he was carrying nothing of unusual value are there any local conditions unfavorable to flying none at all it is much uninhabited country but there is no reason why it shouldn't be safe country to fly over there are some damnably unfavorable local conditions doctor although i can't tell you what they are broke in operative carnes of the united states secret service dick purdy was rather more than an acquaintance of mine after he was lost i looked into the record of that section a little it is known among aviators as the port of missing planes how did it get a name like that from the number of unexplained and unexplainable accidents that happened right there dugan of the air mail was lost there last may they found the mail bags where he had dropped them before he crashed but they never found a trace of him or his plane they didn't not a trace the same thing happened when mayfield cracked in august he made a jump and broke his neck in the landing he was found all right but his ship wasn't tiersen of the army dropped there and his plane was never found neither was he he was seen to go down in a forced landing he was flying last in a formation as soon as he went down the other ships turned back and circled over the ground where he should have fallen they saw nothing search parties found no trace of either him or his ship those are the best known cases but i have heard rumors of several private ships which have gone down in that district and have never been seen or heard of since dr bird sat forward with a glitter in his piercing black eyes carnes gave a grunt of satisfaction he knew the meaning of that glitter the doctor's interest had been fully aroused inspector dolan said dr bird sharply why didn't you tell me those things well doctor we don't like to talk about mail wrecks any more than we have to of course the loss of so many planes in one area is merely a coincidence probably the wrecked planes were stolen as souvenirs such things happen you know fiddlesticks said dr beard sharply he raised one long slender hand with beautifully mottled tapered fingers and threw back his unruly mop of black hair his square almost rugged jaw protruded and the glitter in his eyes grew in intensity 
no souvenir hunting vandals could cart away whole planes without leaving a trace in that case what became of the bodies no inspector this has gone beyond the range of coincidence there is some mystery here and it needs looking into fortunately my work at the bureau of standards is in such shape that i can safely leave it i intend to devote my entire time to clearing this matter up the ramifications may run deeper than either you or i suspect please have all your records dealing with plain disappearances or wrecks in that locality sent to my office at once the post office inspector stiffened of course dr bird he said formally we are very glad to hear any suggestion that you may care to offer when it comes however to a matter of surrendering control of a post office matter to the department of commerce or to the treasury department i doubt the propriety our records are confidential ones and are not open to every one who is curious i will inform the proper authorities of your desire to help but i doubt seriously if they will avail themselves of your offer dr bird's black eyes shot fire idiot he said if you're a specimen of the post office department i'll have the entire case taken out of your hands do you mean to cooperate with me or not i fail to see what interest the bureau of standards can have in the affair the bureau isn't mixed up in it dr bird is if necessary i will go direct to the president oh thunder what's the use of talking to you who's your chief chief inspector watkins is in charge of all investigations carnes get him on the telephone tell him we are taking charge of the investigation if he bulks have bolton go over his head then get the chief of the air corps on the wire and arrange for an army plane tomorrow there is something more than a mail robbery back of this or i'm badly fooled do you suspect i suspect nothing and no one carnes yet i'll get a few instruments together to take with us tomorrow we'll fly over that section until something happens if it takes us until this time next year a three-seated scout plane rose from langley field at eight the next morning captain garland was at the controls in the rear cockpit sat dr bird and carnes inside his flying helmet the doctor wore a pair of headphones which were connected to a box on the floor before him carnes carried no apparatus but his hand rested carelessly on the grip of a machine gun the plane cleared bellefonte at nine thirty and bore east towards phillipsburg captain garland kept his eyes on his instrument board and on a map less than six hundred feet above the ground he was following the air mail route as exactly as possible overhead a mail plane winged its way east three thousand feet above them fifteen minutes brought them to phillipsburg captain garland shot his plane upward a few hundred feet turn back captain said dr bird into the speaking tubes retrace your course a quarter of a mile farther north at bellefonte turn back and go over the same ground another quarter of a mile north keep flying back and forth working your way north until i tell you to stop the plane swung around and headed back towards bellefonte of course we can't tell exactly what route he followed said the doctor to carnes but he was new on this run and it's safe to assume that he didn't stray far we'll quarter the whole area before we stop carnes watched the ground below them carefully there was nothing about it to distinguish it from any other wooded mountainous country and his interest waned he glanced aloft the mail plane had disappeared in the distance and the sky was clear of aircraft he turned again to the ground it looked closer than it had before he turned and looked at the duplicate altimeter the plane had lost nearly a hundred feet elevation there's something wrong about this plane doctor came captain garland's voice through the speaking tube it doesn't behave like it should 
i guess we've found out what we're looking for carnes said dr bird grimly what seems to be the matter captain blessed if i know was the answer it felt like a drag of some sort like an automobile going through heavy sand we're slowing down though i am giving her all the gun i've got cut your motor said the doctor shortly he bent over the duplicate instrument board as the roar of the motor died away carnes rose and looked over the side look doctor he cried in a strained voice directly below them yawned a hole sixty feet in diameter and extending down into the bowels of the earth the plane hovered over the hole for a moment and then slowly descended into it what is it cried the detective it's the secret of the port of missing planes replied dr bird throw off your parachute keep your gun and light handy but don't fire unless i do first the same holds good for you captain the plane sunk until it was fifty feet below the level of the ground carnes looked up gradually the circle of sky became blurred and hazy as though the air were heavy with dust the rasp of dr bird's flashlight key aroused him and he hastily wound his own the haze above them grew thicker suddenly the light died and then came darkness a darkness so thick and absolute that it bore down on them like a weight dr bird's light stabbed a path through it they were in a tunnel or tube reaching into the ground the sides were smooth and polished as though water-worn the plane sank deeper and deeper into the earth suddenly dr bird's light went out what's the matter doctor asked carnes did your light fail no came a strained voice i turned it out why i don't know light yours carnes reached into his pocket dr bird could hear his breath coming in panting sobs as though he were exerting his whole strength i can't do it doctor he gasped i want to but some power greater than my will prevents me are you affected captain asked the doctor i can't move came in muffled accent from the front cockpit some power beyond my knowledge has us in its grasp said the doctor all we can do is sit tight and see what happens we are no longer falling at any rate from the forward cockpit came a rustling sound there was a slight jar in the ship and it gave as though a weight had been applied to one side what are you doing garland asked the doctor sharply there was no reply again came the rustling sound the ship gave a sudden lurch as though a weight had left the side carnes suddenly spoke good-bye doctor he said i'm going over the side i have been fighting it but i'm going myself in a minute replied the doctor grimly something is pulling me over it's the same power that keeps me from turning on my light it's perfectly safe to go over said carnes suddenly the plane is resting on a solid base i have the same feeling catch hold of my belt and let's go they climbed over the side of the plane and dropped to the ground their descent made absolutely no sound dr bird stopped and felt the floor crepe rubber or something of the sort he murmured at any rate it's noise and vibration proof now what asked carnes this way replied the doctor confidently i'm beginning to get the hang of understanding this the way is perfectly level and open before us keep your hand on my shoulder and step right out how do you know where we're going i don't but something tells me that the road is level and open it is the same thing that brought us over the side i can't explain it but it's some sort of a telepathic control exerted by an intelligence whether the sending mine is reinforced by instruments i don't know but i rather fancy not where is garland he went off in another direction i could feel the power that guided him although it was not directed at us something tells me that he is safe for the present for half a mile they made their way through the darkness before they stopped this time carnes could plainly understand the command which came to both of them 
there is a table before us said dr bird lay your flashlight and pistol on it carnes struggled against the order but the power guiding him was stronger than his will he strove to turn on his light when he could not he tried to cock his pistol with a sigh he laid his gun and light on the table before him without words the two men walked forward a few feet and sat confidently down on a bench that something told them was there for a moment they sat quietly a cry choked in the middle came from the detective's throat cold clammy hands touched his face he strove again to cry out but his voice was paralyzed the hands went methodically over his body evidently searching for weapons mustering up his will carnes made a grab for one of them his captor apparently had no objection to the detective's action for carnes seized the hand without effort but he almost dropped it the hand was as large as a ham he reached out for the other hand but could not locate it a movement on the part of his captor brought it to him and he made the startling discovery that the palms were directed outward the hand had only four fingers which were armed with long curved claws instead of nails carnes ran his hand up the palm to search for a thumb but found none he found however that while the hands were naked the wrists were covered with short thick fur doctor he cried there's again came the overpowering will and his speech died away in silence he sat dumb and motionless while his captor moved over to dr bird a second animal came forward and felt the detective over he was not allowed to move this time nor was he while a third and fourth animal went carefully over him the four drew back some distance doctor whispered carnes as the influence grew fainter Shh! was the answer and as the doctor demanded for silence it was reinforced by another wave of paralyzing power carnes had no choice as he sat there silent the power which held him again seemed to grow less he found that he could move his arms slightly he edged forward to get his gun in light before he reached them a beam of light split the darkness dr bird stood electric torch in hand staring before him at a distance of a few feet stood a group of half a dozen animals about the height of a man as they stood erect on their short hind legs they were covered with heavy brown fur their lower limbs were thin and light but their shoulders and forelegs were heavy and powerful their forepaws which had the palms facing outward were armed with the long wicked claws he had felt no visible ears protruded from the round skulls their heads appeared to rest between their shoulders so short were their necks their muzzles were long and obtusely pointed through grinning jaws could be seen powerful white teeth talipidae cried dr bird carnes they are a race of giant intellectual moles despite the fact that they had no visible eyes the creatures were strongly affected by the light they dropped on all fours and turned their backs to the scientist and the detective two of them scurried away down a long tunnel which opened from the room in which they stood dr bird turned his light up and swept the room it was roughly circular a hundred feet in diameter with a roof ten feet high dozens of tunnels led off in every direction your light carnes quick cried the doctor in a strained voice carnes reached towards the table for his light before he could reach it he was frozen into immobility from the corner of his eye he could watch the doctor dr bird was struggling to bring the light back on the moles which stood before them great beads of sweat stood out on his forehead inch by inch he moved the light closer to his goal but carnes could see that his thumb was stealing up towards the switch button his breath came in sobs suddenly the light went out for some time the two men sat motionless on the bench unable to speak or move one of the moles stepped forward before them and gave a mental command the two rose to their feet for a mile or more they followed their guide then at a silent command they turned to the right for a few steps and stopped 
in another moment the numbing influence had departed are you all right carnes yes right as can be doctor what were those things where are we what is it all about we'll find out in time i guess replied the doctor with a chuckle carnes isn't this the darndest thing we've ever been through captured half a mile underground by a race of giant talpidae's before whose mental orders we are as helpless as children did you understand any of their talk talk i didn't hear any well mental conversation then they made no sound no all i understood was the orders i obeyed End of chapter 13 Part 1 The Port of Missing Plains Section 14 of The Astounding Stories 20 August 1931 This is a LibriVox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording done by Jules Harlock of Mississauga, Ontario, Canada. Astounding Stories, 20, August 1931. The Port of Missing Plains by Captain S. P. Meek. Part 2 i got a good deal of it the doctor said we are evidently in or near a sort of central community of these fellows they spoke thought is a better word they thought of doing away with us but decided to wait until they consulted someone with more authority you see we are not airplane pilots captain garland was taken at once to the place where they have other aviators imprisoned what do they want of pilots underground i couldn't quite get that there was another thought that i am not sure that i interpreted correctly if i did there is some man of the upper world down here in a position of considerable authority among them he has some use for pilots but what use i don't know we are to be held until he is consulted who could it be i can only think of one man carnes and i hope i'm wrong i don't have to name him you mean ivan saranoff we haven't heard of him or had any activity from him for the last eight months we know that he had a subterranean borer with which he had penetrated deep into the earth isn't it possible that he has at some time in his explorations come into contact with these fellows and made friends with them it's possible doctor but i hope we had killed him when we destroyed his borer so did i but he seems to bear a charmed life several times we have thought him dead only to have him show up with some new form of devil's work it is too much to hope that we have succeeded in doing away with him did you notice one thing those fellows were helpless while i held the light on them the one which was holding us captive got so interested in the discussion about our fate that he momentarily forgot us that was when i got my light until i turned the light away from them we were free men that's right answered the secret service man remembering that the next time we get a light on a bunch of them hold them in the beam until we can make terms if we ever get hold of a light again i have a light they didn't get probably because they didn't think of it while they were around it is one of those fountain pen battery affairs and they probably took it for a pen i won't turn it on now partly to save it and partly not to let them know we have it let's see what our prison is like they felt their way around the room it proved to be eight paces by ten in size like the tunnels it was floored with crepe rubber or some similar substance which gave out no sound of footprints yet was firm underfoot the room was furnished with two beds a table and two chairs there was no sign of a door 
that's that exclaimed the doctor when they had finished their exploration i'm hungry i wonder when we eat hello here comes one of the fellows now carnes made no reply as the doctor's speech ended a wave of mental power enveloped the room one of the moles entered moved over to the table for an instant and then left the room an earthly odor of vegetables pervaded the room my question is answered said the doctor we eat now he moved to the table on it had been placed dishes containing three different types of roots two of them proved to be palpable but the third was woody and bitter the prisoners made a hearty meal from the two they relished for an hour they sat waiting here they come again exclaimed the doctor we are going before the person i spoke of can't you get their thoughts no i can't doctor i can understand when i get a command but aside from those times everything is a blank to me my mental wave receiver if that's what it is must be attuned to a different frequency than yours for i can hear them talking to one another i guess i should say that i can feel them thinking to one another at any rate they want us to follow come along the road will be open and level the doctor stepped out confidently with carnes at his heels for half a mile they went forward presently they halted we are in a big chamber here carnes whispered the doctor and there is someone before us we'll have some light in a minute his prophecy was soon fulfilled a vague glimmer of light began to fill the cavern in which they stood as it grew stronger they could see a raised dais before them on which were seated three figures two of them were the giant moles each of the moles wore a helmet which covered his head completely with no sign of lenses or other means of vision it was the central figure however which held the attention of the prisoners seated on a chair and regarding them with an expression of sardonic amusement was a man above a high forehead rose a thin scrub of white hair keen brown eyes peered at them from under almost hairless brows the nose was high bridged and aquiline and went well with his prominent cheekbones his mouth was a mere gash below his nose framed by thin bloodless lips the lips were curled in a sneer revealing yellow teeth the whole expression of the face was one of revolting cruelty so said the figure slowly fate has been kind to me my friends dr bird and operative carnes have chosen to pay me a long visit i am greatly flattered the thin metallic voice with its noticeable accent struck a familiar chord sarnoff grasped carnes yes mr carnes sarnoff professor ivan sarnoff of the faculty of st petersburg once now merely sarnoff the scourge of the bourgeoisie i hope we had killed you murmured carnes it was no fault of dr bird's that he failed replied the russian with an excess of malevolence in his voice his method was a correct one merely the fortuitous fact that we had just pierced one of the tunnels of the salome and i was away from my boring exploring it saved me you did me a good turn doctor without meaning to you destroyed an instrument on which i had relied in doing so you unwittingly delivered into my hands a power greater than any i had dreamed of the salome what can a mental cripple like you do with blind allies like them asked dr beard with a contemptuous laugh the russian half rose from his seat in rage for a moment his hand toyed with a switch before him the sardonic sneer came back into his face and he dropped back into his seat you nearly provoked me to destroy you doctor he said but cold calculation saved you since you will never return to the upper world save when and as i decree i have no objection to telling you 
the salome are not blind their eyes are under the skin as is the case with many of the talipidae but for all that they can see very well their eyes function on a shorter wave than ours a wave so short that it readily penetrates through miles of earth and rock this cavern is now flooded with it visible light the light by which we see is limited to their eyes hence the helmets which you see they can see through those helmets as well as you or i can see through air what do you intend to do with us ah doctor you hit me in a tender spot i have a sore temptation to close this switch on which my hand rests were i to do so both you and mr carnes would vanish forever i have however conceived a very real affection for you too your brains doctor working in my behalf instead of against me would render me well-nigh omnipotent mr carnes has a certain low cunning which i can also use to advantage both of you will join me you might as well close your switch and save your breath sarnoff for we will do nothing of the sort replied the doctor sharply ah but you will so will mr carnes i had no hopes that you would join me willingly in fact i am pleased that you do not i could never trust you all the same you will join my forces as have the others whom i have brought into the hands of the Siloam. i have ways of accomplishing my desires it pleases my fancy doctor to use your brains in aiding me in my scientific developments you will enjoy working with the scientists of the Siloam. among them you will find brains which excel any to be found on the surface of the earth since we too are below already i have learned much from them you mr carnes shall be taught to pilot an airplane when my cohorts go forth from the realms of the Siloam to establish the rules of russia you will be piloting one of the planes your first task will be to learn to fly i refuse to do anything of the sort said carnes i will not be ready to have your flying lessons started until tomorrow replied the russian and you will have until then to reconsider your rash decision it will be much easier for you if you obey my orders if you still refuse to-morrow you will pay a visit to the laboratory of the Siloam. when you return your lessons will be started you will now be taken to your cell i have use for dr bird this afternoon i won't leave dr bird and that's flat exclaimed carnes dr bird interrupted him go ahead carnesy old dear he said lightly you might just as well toddle along under your own power as to be dragged along you have a day for reflection in any event i dare say i see you again before they do anything to you carnes glanced keenly at the doctor's face what he saw evidently reassured him for he turned without a word and walked away the light grew gradually dimmer until darkness again reigned in the cavern come doctor said sarnoff's voice we have work to do carnes sat alone in his cell for hours the darkness and the loneliness wore on him until he felt that his nerves would crack not a sound came to him he threw himself on one of the beds and plugged his ears with his fingertips in an attempt to keep the silence out then a cheerful voice sounded in the cell and a friendly hand fell on his shoulder well carnsey old dear said dr bird have you been lonesome dr bird gasped carnes in a tone of relief are you all right right as can be i learned a lot this afternoon for one thing you're going to start flying lessons tomorrow and you're going to do your best to become an expert pilot in a short time it is the only thing to do and fly a plane for sarnoff i hope not the only way to avoid that very thing is to keep you mentally unimpaired so that i can call on you for help when i need it 
if the salome operate on you you will be useless to me operate what do you mean i'll tell you the salome are a very old and highly civilized people for ages they have possessed scientific knowledge for which the upper world scientists are now blindly groping among other things they have a perfect knowledge of the workings of the brain if they operate they will remove from your brain every speck of memory you have of past events leaving only those things that will be useful to saranoff you will be his complete slave in that condition you will be taught to fly a plane when the time comes you will fly one with no remembrance of anything which happened prior to the operation and with no will but his it will be easier to teach you flying in your natural state if you are willing you will be willing if you wish it doctor i do wish it most decidedly dr beard went on obey every order they give you you will find that the salome are a very enlightened and civilized race they are very kindly and would willingly harm no one then why have they taken up with sarnoff he is the first man with whom they have come into contact he has told them a horrible tale of conditions on the surface and they have swallowed it hook line and sinker they believe that he is going to establish a new order of happiness and plenty for all with the aid of his gang of cutthroats from russia if they had the slightest inkling of the true state of affairs they would turn on him in an instant why don't you tell them remember that i am a stranger here and he has poisoned their minds against me although the mind of an ordinary man is an open book to them they cannot read sarnoff's secret thoughts against his will they can't read mine either for that matter i am working in the laboratory and i will pick up a great deal when the time comes we will strike for our liberty and for the safety of the world did you learn sarnoff's plans yes he is gathering planes and pilots in the underground caverns of the salome when he gets enough he will bring men from russia to man the planes what could the united states or the world for that matter do against a fleet of hundreds possibly thousands of the best planes equipped with deadly weapons unknown to their science that menace confronts us as we must remove it to give you some idea of the power of the salome this afternoon sarnoff and i with one assistant opened a cavern in the solid rock three miles long and a mile wide and over six hundred feet in height three men how on earth did you do it two men and one mole we did it with a ray the secret of which only the salome and sarnoff know you have told me a disintegrating ray is an impossibility objected carnes it is this is not a disintegrating ray carnes either i am crazy or the salome have solved the secret of time the fourth dimension i haven't been able to grasp the whole thing yet what i think we did was to remove that rock a distance perhaps only a millionth of a second forward or back into time at any rate it ceased to exist yet they can bring it back unchanged at will that was the way they captured our plane they sent out a magnetic ray of such power that it stopped our plane in mid-air and brought it to the ground they removed the rock from beneath us and lowered us into the hole by reversing the process they restored things to their original condition all of these tunnels and rooms were made in that way i still don't understand how they did it i don't either but i hope to in time now let's go to bed it's late tomorrow you will start your lessons with captain garland as an instructor he won't know you for he was operated on this afternoon do your best to become a pilot when i get ready i want you with me in full possession of all your faculties the next morning the two prisoners separated and went to their duties in the cavern which dr beard had described captain garland was waiting 
beside the plane he had flown. He did not know Carnes, but he still knew how to fly. Declining to enter into any conversation, he started expounding the theory of flying to the detective. Carnes remembered Dr. Bird's words and applied himself wholeheartedly. For four hours they worked together. At the end of that time the light faded in the cavern and Carnes was led by an unseen guide back to his cell. He threw himself on a bed and awaited Dr. Bird's return. I have learned a few more things about the Salome, said the doctor when he entered the cell several hours later. We are in their largest community. They have cities or warrens scattered all over the world. Each city has its own ruler, but the whole race are ruled by an overlord or king who habitually lives here. He is away visiting a community under northern Africa just now but he will be back in a few days. The Salom are sincere in their desire to help the upper world. They feel great pity for mankind in view of the conditions Sarnoff has described to them. When the king returns, I plan to make a direct appeal to him. In the meantime, go on with your flying lessons. How did you make out today? the second day was a repetition of the first as were the third and fourth a week passed before dr bird entered the cell in evident excitement has hannock brought our evening meal yet he asked anxiously no doctor good take this light as soon as he enters throw the light full on him and hold him until i work on him we've got to make our escape why the king is due back tomorrow. Sarnoff is frightened at the good impression I have made on the Salome. He is supreme in the monarch's absence, so he plans to operate on both of us before he returns. He is afraid to allow me to see the king with an unimpaired intellect and memory. Shh! Here comes Hannock. The door to their cell opened noiselessly. When the mole who brought their food was well inside, Carnes turned on the tiny flashlight. The mole dropped on all fours and tried to turn its back. Dr. Bird sprang forward. For an instant his slim muscular fingers worked on the mole's neck and shoulders. Silently the animal sank in a heap. Come on, Carnes, cried the doctor. Turn off the light. Did you kill him, doctor? asked Carnes as he raced down a pitch-dark corridor at the scientist's heels. No, I merely paralyzed him temporarily. He'll be all right in a day or so. Turn here. For ten minutes they ran down corridor after corridor. Carnes soon lost all track of direction, but Dr. Bird never hesitated. Presently he slowed down to a walk. It's a good thing I have a good memory, he said. I planned that course out from a map, and I had to memorize every turn and distance of it. We are now behind your flying hall and away from any of the regular dwellings of the Salom. Straight west, about four miles, is one of the time ray machines with a guard over it. Aside from them, there isn't a mole between here and Detroit. What are you going to do, doctor? Keep out of their way and avoid recapture if we can. If we merely wanted to escape, we would try to get possession of that time ray machine and open the road to the surface. However, I am not content with that. I want to stay underground until Astok, their king, returns. When he comes, we will surrender to him. Suppose they operate without giving us a chance to present our side of the affair. If they do, Sarnoff wins, but they won't. The more I have seen of the Salome, the more impressed I am by their sense of justice. They'll give us a hearing all right, and a fair one. For two hours the doctor led the way. At the end of that time he stopped. We've gone as far as we need to, he said. They'll undoubtedly send out searching parties, but if we can avoid thinking, they won't be able to find us. The tunnels are a perfect labyrinth. If you care to sleep, go to it. We'll be safer sleeping than awake. 
for we won't be sending out thoughts so fast. End of part two of the ports of missing planes. Section 15 of Astounding Stories 20, August 1931. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording done by Jules Harlech of Mississauga, Ontario, Canada. Astounding Stories 20, August 1931 The Port of Missing Plains by Captain S. P. Meek Part 3 Dr. Bird threw himself down on the rubber floor of the tunnel and was soon asleep. Carnes tried to follow his example, but sleep would not come to him. Frantically he tried to think of nothing. By an effort he would sit for a few minutes with his mind a conscious blank, but thoughts would throng in, in spite of him. Time and again he brought himself up with a jerk and forced his mind to become a blank. The hours passed slowly. Carnes grew cramped from long immobility and rose. A sudden thought intruded itself into his mind. I might as well throw that light away, he murmured to himself. It will be no good now. The Salome won't hurt us if they do catch us. He reached in his pocket for the light. He was about to hurl it from him when a moment of sanity came to him. He stared about. The impulse to hurl the light away came stronger. He strove in vain to turn it on. Doctor, he cried suddenly, wake up. They're after us. With a bound, Dr. Bird was on his feet. The light, he cried, where is it? In my hand, murmured Carnes with stiffening lips. Dr. Bird seized the light. A beam stabbed the darkness. Less than fifty feet from them stood two moles. As the light flashed on, Carnes regained control of himself. Take the light, Carnes, snapped the doctor. I've got to put these fellows to sleep. Slowly he advanced towards the motionless Salome. He had almost reached them when the light flickered out. He turned and raced at full speed toward the detective. Carnes was standing rigid and motionless. Dr. Bird took the light from his hand, despite the almost overpowering drag on his mind. He managed to turn it on. He swung the beam around in a circle. Besides the two Salome he had seen before, the light revealed a pair standing behind him. As the light struck them, the numbing influence vanished for an instant from the doctor's mind. He moved a step forward and then halted. The moles behind him were hurling waves of mental power at him. Again the light cleared him for an instant, but he got a brief glance of other moles hurrying from every direction. The jig's up, I guess, he muttered. He strove to free himself by the use of his light. But the tiny battery had done its duty, and gradually the light grew dimmer. The influence grew too strong for him. With a sigh, he shut off the feeble ray and hurled the light from him. The moles closed in. All right, said the doctor audibly. We'll go peaceably. As he spoke, the paralyzing power was withdrawn. With Carnes at his side, he retraced the route he had taken from the cell. Before they reached it, they turned off. Dr. Bird realized that they were treading the familiar path to the laboratory. Outside the laboratory, the Salome halted. A wave of mental power enveloped the prisoners, and they remained silent and motionless while their escort withdrew. From the laboratory came three of the Salome scientists. As the laboratory door opened, they could see that it was bathed in a flood of light and that the moles wore helmets covering their heads. They moved inside. Clad in a white gown, stood Saranoff. So, my friends, you would run away and leave me, would you? gloated the Russian. 
and just when I had planned a very beneficial operation for you. I will remove permanently from your brains all the delusions which now encumber them, and from your own puny wills I will substitute my own. The power which had held the prisoners silent disappeared. You have caught us, sour enough, said Dr. Bird. I know the power you wield, and that you are making no idle boast. I appeal, however, to these others, my friends. The operation you are planning to perform is not a routine one. It is one that should have the sanction of the king before it is done. I appeal from you to him. He is far away, laughed Saranoff. When he returns, your plea will be presented to him, but it will be too late to do any good. You are right, doctor. I do not plan a mere routine operation. Not only will I remove your memory, but I am going to use the time ray on you and banish forever into the unknown a portion of your brains. Without knowing which adjustment I make of the infinite number possible, no one, not even the king, can ever recall it. Dr. Bird turned to the Siloam scientists and hurled his thoughts at them. This man intends to commit a horrible crime, he thought, and one which he has no authority to perform. To you I appeal for justice. Bid him wait until Astok returns, and let him be the judge as to whether it shall be done. Jumor, you know me well. You know that my brain is the equal of one of the Siloam. Even you cannot read my thoughts against my will. Are you willing to see that brain destroyed? Astok will be here soon, and nothing will be lost by a short delay. He thinks truly, was the answering thought of Jumor. It would be better to wait. We will not wait, Crash Saranoff's thought into their consciousness. He killed Hanak when he escaped and his punishment shall be as I have decreed. Did not the king give me full power while he was away? It is true that he ordered us to obey this man in all things dealing with upper world men, thought Jumor. If it is true that he killed Hanak, his punishment is doubtless just. I did not kill Hanak, returned the doctor. He is paralyzed and will be all right in a few hours if he isn't already. I demand that you wait until Astok returns. When an appeal is made to him, no other may judge. So say the Siloam law. That is true, replied Jumar. We will wait until the king returns. We will not wait, came Saranoff's thought. The king delegated to me his powers during his absence. As far as all the world, save the Siloam, were concerned. Were it one of the Siloam appealing to the king, I would be powerless before the appeal. These are not bound by Siloam law and are not entitled to its benefits. We will operate at once. Then you will operate alone, retorted Jumor. I will not assist you. I need none of your help, thought Saranoff. Asmos and Kamol, will you help me? If you refuse, I will report to Astok that you have disobeyed and defied his chosen delegate. We had better assist him, Jumor, thought Asmos. Astok did delegate his authority. I am not of the nobility, and I dare not refuse to help. Suit yourself, Asmos, replied Jumor. I refuse to assist and will appeal to Astok against him. The third mold hesitated. You are higher in rank than we are, Jumar, he thought at length, and like Asmos, I dare not resist him. I hear the king give this upper earth man his authority while he was away. I will assist, and I will leave the room, retorted Jumar. He moved to a door and threw it open, at the threshold he paused and sent back a final thought. I will appeal to Astok, our ruler. I will send now a message to him to hurry home that he may judge between us. The door closed behind him. Saranoff chuckled audibly. Goodbye, Carnes, said Dr. Bird sadly. 
this devil can do all he says he can and more i'm sorry i brought you and garland into this mess oh well it can't be helped doctor replied the detective with an attempt at cheerfulness what is he going to do to us he'll have to use instruments for what he plans said the doctor ordinarily a routine mental operation is performed without the use of extraneous power the mind of the operator is electrically connected to the mind of the victim by means of thought waves the operator banishes from the mind of the subject such portions of his memory and mentality as he chooses he may then substitute other things in place of what he has removed any of the salome could operate on you but i doubt whether jumour himself could do it successfully on me without aid from power here come the instruments asmos and kamol took from the cabinet on the side of the wall what looked like a cloth helmet attached to it were a dozen wires which they connected to a box on a table the box was made of crystal and inside it could be seen a number of vacuum tubes and coils of various designs other leads led to a similar helmet which asmos placed on sarnoff's head a heavy cable ran to a switch on the wall as kamal closed the switch the tubes in the box began to glow with weird lights violet green and orange streamers of light came from them to dance in wild patterns on the laboratory walls for five minutes sarnoff made adjustments to the dials on the front of the crystal box the colored lights died away and a gentle golden glow came from the apparatus he threw off the helmet kamal left the laboratory and returned with a large coil on the top of which was mounted a parabolic reflector a device like a clock on the front of the coil was constantly marking the passage of time the dial had two indicators which were together sarnoff chuckled you may not have seen this device work doctor he said in order to let you know what you are facing i will demonstrate he turned the reflector so that it bore on the wall he adjusted the moving dial so that the two indicators were no longer together as he closed the switch the wall before the reflector vanished sarnoff turned off the power that portion of the wall has gone back in time exactly three seconds he announced as far as the present is concerned it has ceased to exist it is following us through time three seconds behind us but in all eternity it will never catch up unless i aid it since the exact time is known it can be restored if i were to alter this adjustment ever so little it could never be recalled watch me he again closed the switch this time in a reverse direction the wall instantly filled up as it had been before he moved the time dial so that the two indicators coincided after i have sent a portion of your physical brain into the past or the future as the fancy strikes me i will change the adjustment of that dial since there are an infinite number of adjustments to which i might have set it the chances that anyone could ever duplicate my settings and restore it are a complement of infinity or zero he said i am now ready to remove your memory if the impossible should happen and your physical brain be restored it would be useless asmos adjust the helmet i will operate on my friend the doctor first carnes strove to rush to dr bird's assistance but he was helpless before the force of kamol's will asmos adjusted the helmet to dr bird's head and buckled it firmly in place with an evil grin sarnoff donned the other helmet good-bye dr bird he said mockingly you will continue to see me but you won't know me except as your master his hand reached for the switch it had almost closed on it when sarnoff stopped convulsively 
he sat motionless while the laboratory door opened and jumor entered the room he was followed by another mole the newcomer was fully six inches taller than the others his head was hidden by a helmet but around his arms he wore strings of sparkling jewels ivan saranoff what means this his powerful thoughts dominated the room i was merely engaged in rectifying some of the mental errors of this man of the upper earth explained the russian eagerly it is merely a routine operation such as you gave me authority to perform an operation which uses power is not routine replied the king i am told that this upper earth man has a brain equal to those of my most advanced scientist i am also told that you plan to do more than rectify his mental errors you have been falsely informed i was merely about to adjust his memory then what means this the king pointed to the time ray machine that was brought here in order that it could be used when you returned thought the russian eagerly this upper earth man killed hanek when he brought him food the door opened and hanek entered oh astok objected hanek's thoughts when these upper earth men had me at their mercy with a the light they spared me they paralyzed me for a time so that they might escape but they did it in such a manner that no harm came to me so jumer told me replied the king release them in an instant carnes was on his feet removing the helmet from dr bird's head the doctor struggled to his feet dr bird thought the king can you communicate with me easily yes your majesty but may i ask that you alter the vibration period of my comrade mr carnes he cannot understand you with his present low period the king stepped to the box with which sarnoff had been working in response to his commands the helmet which had been on dr bird's head was placed on the detective the king made a few adjustments to the dials and signaled for the helmet to be removed can you understand me mr carnes he asked mentally the question leaped with startling clearness in the detective's head carefully he framed his answer i can understand you said the king i will now sit in judgment on the appeal made to me dr bird tell me your story with eloquent thoughts dr bird poured forth the history of the upper world he told of the great war and the collapse of the russian monarchy he traced history to the fall of the moderate party and the rise of the bolsheviki he described the horrible conditions existing in russia at the end he reviewed the long battle he and carnes had fought against sarnoff when he had finished the king questioned carnes the detective repeated the story in different words and the king turned to sarnoff from the russian's mind came a tissue of distorted facts and downright lies he denied or twisted around everything that the detective and the scientist had said when he had done with his tale astok sat in secret thought for a few minutes the tales you tell me are so far apart that i can give credence to none of them he announced at length there is but one solution although they are never used for the salome have forgotten the meaning of a falsehood we have instruments which will drag the truth from the brain of the liar they are powerful and their use may easily be fatal if a man gives forth the contents of his brain willingly the process is not painful if he tries to conceal anything it is torture will you willingly submit your brains to the searching of this instrument gladly came dr bird's thought and carnes re-echoed it and you ivan saranoff demanded the king i will not submit thought the russian sullenly you will be examined whether you submit willingly or not replied astok i am going to learn the truth though i kill you all to get it at the king's order jumor hastened from the laboratory 
he returned in a few minutes with an apparatus similar to the one which sarnoff had planned to use on dr bird but larger and with more dials on the crystal box at a command from the king dr bird donned the helmet the king manipulated switches and dials around dr bird's head glowed a halo of crimson light twice an expression of momentary pain passed over his countenance after half an hour astok cut on the power and nodded to carnes don't try to hold anything back carnes he said dr bird sharply you couldn't if you tried and the process is very painful i can assure you with the helmet on his head the detective sat for ten minutes while the salome king went through his brain a dozen times he shrieked in agony but his moments of suffering were short the king removed the helmet your minds agree well he thought now i will examine the mind of my friend the helmet was strapped on sarnoff instantly an expression of the utmost anguish crossed his face shriek after shriek of agony came from his writhing lips relentlessly the king applied more power the cries of the russian grew heart-rendering suddenly he grew rigid and slumped forward in his chair astok impassively manipulated his instrument after half an hour he opened the switch and removed the helmet under the ministrations of jumor the russian revived the king sat in secret thought for an hour i have examined the brains of all of you he announced at length and i find hopeless contradictions each of you believes thoroughly in his own social order both tell me of hopeless misery on the part of a large portion of his people both tell of the horrible wars and suffering beyond my comprehension the thoughts of all of you teem with modes of bringing death to your fellow beings your entire science has been perverted to the ends of destruction nothing of the sort can be realized by the salom where truth justice and mercy prevail each of you holds that his form of government is better than the other and will cause less suffering and misery than the others none of you hold out hope of happiness for your fellow beings i do not know which system is less obnoxious my decision is made the salon will not interfere in the affairs of the upper earth you may fight out your battles without aid and without interference i will operate on both ivan saranoff and dr bird and i will remove from their minds all knowledge of our science and instruments and leave them in the same condition that they were in when they entered my realms each of you will then be returned to upper earth ivan saranoff to russia dr bird and mr carnes to the united states the pilots whom i hold prisoner will have their mentalities restored and be returned to their homes the planes we have captured i will send off into time so that they can never be used for the misery of upper earth men again jumor you will carry out these orders i wish i could remember how that time machine was built and operated said dr bird reflectively as he sat in his private laboratory in the bureau of standards some time later but jumor did his work well i can't even remember what the thing looked like well doctor our trip below wasn't a loss we removed a very real menace to the established order of things and we have got rid of sarnoff temporarily it will take him some time to return here from russia three weeks or less said dr bird pessimistically however we have gained one other thing did you notice this he pulled what looked like a watch from his pocket carnes regarded it with a puzzled expression no doctor what is it it is a very small camera which takes pictures one half inch by seven eighths i had several opportunities to use it i wasn't sure that it would work on such short waves but it did when sarnoff tries to return to this country he will find that every immigration inspector and every member of the border patrol has an excellent likeness of him 
that may hinder his entrance into the country for a little while end of part three and the end of the story of the ports of missing plains Section 16 of Astounding Stories 20, August 1931. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Astounding Stories 20, August 1931, by Captain S. P. Meek. A classification of the universe. A classification of everything in the universe from the smallest thing yet measured the electron less than a millionth of the millionth of an inch in extent to the biggest a star system of a thousand million trillion miles was described recently by professor harlow shapley of harvard in a lecture at the Kummer center of the college of the city of new york looking forward to a time when men will be able to measure even smaller things than an electron and larger than the greatest star system professor shapley explained that he had let the classification open at both ends men professor shapley said occupies a very small place in all this system although besides an electron or an atom he is not so negligible at that the survey it was explained aims toward giving perspective it gives a sane and modest view of a man's place in the scheme the significance of the classification lies in the skeleton which has afforded all science to bring some measure of order out of the world's present chaotic knowledge of the systems of various kinds all systems find a place in this synthesis atoms comets and galaxies men radiation and the space-time complex when looked at in this objective way human beings and all associated terrestrial organisms appear only parenthetically in one of the subdivisions of the class of colloidal aggregates professor shapley discussed the concept of the cosmoplasma this it was explained is at once the most mysterious and fundamental part of the universe and only recently has come under direct experimental study in brief it is the substratum of materials throughout the universe between planets stars and the galaxies it has no obvious systematic organization hence it includes such diverse constituents as the high-speed shooting stars interstellar calcium gas and radiation itself though no one has ever seen an electron the smallest thing included in the classification they have been proven to exist in several ways they give forth flashes of light that can be photographed they have caused the bending of x-rays as they pass through a substance end of a classification of the universe Section 17 of Astounding Stories 20, August 1931. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Astounding Stories 20, August 1931, by Captain S. P. Meek. Chapter 17, The Reader's Corner, Part 1. Likes the Corner. Dear Editor, this month's issue, May, has the best collection of letters you've ever published. All it lacked was a letter from Bernard J. Kenton, that master of epistles and super science stories. One of your readers would like to have the reader's corner omitted. For heaven's sake, don't take it out. I recognize it as one of the best features of our mag, and whenever I open the covers, turn to it directly after having glimpsed the table of contents and the announcement of the stories to appear in the forthcoming issue. Mr. Joseph R. Barnes, whose letter I enjoyed immensely, incidentally, will be interested in knowing that The Mascot Deep is already in book form, and that The Disintegration Machine and When the World Screamed, all by the same author, are under the same covers. He will also be interested in learning that Ray Cummings' fine story, Sea Girl, is also between hardcovers. The idea of putting out a quarterly is a dandy. The other science fiction quarterlies are mere textbooks. There are occasionally, of course, a few exceptions. The thought of the sort of fantastic action stories Astounding Stories publishes, put together in a magazine doubly thick, is a pleasing one to contemplate. Reading a story the length of Brigands of the Moon, and of such literary merit, complete in one issue, is a thrill to be looked forward to. 
by all means put out such a magazine and have stories by jack williamson r f starzl and edmund hamilton three of your best writers in the first issue i am glad to see that starzl is coming back with the next issue more from him please and hamilton and williamson should appear more frequently too a question mr cummings shades of poulter and tuch why must you always have a deformed character in your stories do they appeal to your dramatic sense the news that we're going to have a story from francis flagg brings raptures of a delight to my homely face if it's a dimensional story i'll cheer twice when it comes to writing that kind of a story flagg's the king of them all for sheer interest and originality he's got his contemporaries in that field out distanced with a distance that can only be counted by light years a pat on the back for booth cody and sears langwell two staunch supporters all our magazine needs is a story about time crusaders or a planet of mechanical men omitting the authors already mentioned i consider my favorites to be rousseau eschbach diffin ernst and hal k wells the best story you ever published who am i to answer why not put it up to the readers for a popular vote jerome siegel one o five two two kimberly avenue cleveland ohio explanation wanted dear editor this is my first letter to you but i am a consistent reader of astounding stories and look forward to all of the coming issues i have in mind a question a friendly one not one that i expect to or hope will seem to be trying to dampen any theories this rocket ship propulsion as i understand it there is a void between all planets etc if this is the case how then can a rocket propelled spaceship go across this void since the exhaust of the rockets must rely on some material of a sort or rather some sort of resistance to push the ship along how does it push on nothing of course near earth it has the ground and then the atmosphere to push from but out in the void why not cut off and save fuel therefore saving an extra heavy load of explosives if rocket ships are really practical in space flying yours for a thicker astounding stories h m krausen jr sunter south carolina better than love stories dear editor i have started to read the astounding stories and enjoy it very much although i do not find very many girls writing into the corner this mag is a thousand times better than all those love story magazines and besides these stories are educational i would rather read astounding stories than eat they are not too scientific to be boresome but they are just good enough to be real interesting i wish you would publish some more stories like the lake of light dark moon etc i especially like stories of the future and interplanetary novels anyone wishing to correspond with me will be welcome as i love to write letters and especially to anyone interested in the same things i am miss bernice goldberg 147 crescent drive mason city iowa kidding the editor dear editor i have just finished your january 1932 issue of astounding stories it was superb imagine my delight and surprise when i purchased the first issue this year smooth edges good quality of paper i had a few other articles to purchase but i forgot all about them when i saw your magazine and rushed home to read it it had a most admirable cover designed by your best artist h w wesso i turned to the contents page the first story was by my favorite author ray cummings and called the space car to mars hot dog my favorite theme interplanetary travel all the rest of the authors were my favorites too edmund hamilton captain s p meek s p wright a j burks and a short story by jack williamson i turned to the next page and lo and behold what do i see but an editorial wonders after wonders it was called the possibilities of space travel i was by this time beginning to think that at last the editor had achieved a perfect magazine and when i turned to the first story the one by ray cummings i knew it there was a double page illustration by wesso in soft and realistic colors think of it colored illustrations for each story well i was so excited that i could hardly read but at last i began boy can ray cummings write interplanetary stories e como and how he wove scientific explanations into the story so skillfully that one learned the scientific facts without knowing it 
when he thought that the explanation of some invention would be boresome, he put a little note at the foot of the page. This, I remembered, was an admirable feature of his story, Brigands of the Moon, which you published two years ago. I then turned to the reader's corner, only to discover that its name had been changed to The Observatory. I expect this was taken from the suggestion of P. Leadbeater in the March 1931 issue. I discovered also, to my delight, that at the end of each letter the editor made a few comments. I finished reading the reader's letters, and on the next page I found this lead line. Science Questions and Answers. I read these with enthusiasm. I forgot to mention the raise in the price to 25 cents, but that is immaterial to me now since I have the perfect science fiction magazine. You have surely hitched your wagon, magazine, to a star now. Clay Ferguson, Jr., 510 Park Street, Southwest, Roanoke, Virginia. Sugar Candy. Dear Editor, it is very seldom that I write to any page like The Reader's Corner, but I have gotten rather tired of all those knocks, so I am writing to say that I have missed only one of your issues since the 2nd, February, 1930, and have found only one not to my liking, and I have forgotten what that is. I have no comment to make on your authors. I don't care who writes it or what his literary reputation is, as long as the story is good, and you wouldn't print it if it weren't. As for exact scientific data, away with it. Some may wish to be bored with it, but I prefer action. I like your pictures. They are bizarre, and give one an idea of what the author is trying to convey. And they intrigue the interest before the story is read. I also like the size, because it is not awkward. And I like the edges, because they make the pages easy to turn. This is Margaret M. Finney, 1632 West 3rd, Plainfield, New Jersey. Becoming a Habit Dear Editor, The May Astounding Stories seems to have nothing but complimentary letters in it. Mr. Magnuson probably tore out his hair when he saw all those letters. Not that Astounding Stories fully deserves all that praise. As one reader said, words are inadequate to describe how wonderful your magazine is. However, I do not agree with those who denounce some of the readers for making criticisms and suggestions. No magazine can be absolutely perfect, although Astounding Stories comes pretty near it. Even if it were perfect, the readers would have to keep on making criticisms and suggestions in order to keep it that way. Besides, the reader's corner would become pretty dull and lifeless if you printed nothing but flattering letters. Most of the readers who make unfavorable criticisms really have the welfare of the magazine in mind else they wouldn't write at all. All of them aren't grouches. For example, a certain person sent one of the science fiction magazines about the most vicious and uncomplimentary letter that magazine had ever received. Yet in this issue of Astounding Stories, he jumps on the knockers for daring to say anything against Astounding Stories. So you see that all knockers are not hopeless. I notice that you have complied with one of my requests and have published an autobiography of Mr. Wensler, although there is no picture. Perhaps, as Mr. Wensler suggests, that is for the best. The readers of Astounding Stories are accustomed to pictures of grotesque and weird-looking inhabitants of other planets, but a picture of Mr. Wensler may prove to be too much. Or if you do put it in, you might entitle it Wesso's Conception of a Martian. I hope Mr. Wensler does not take the above paragraph too seriously, like him, I was hit on the head when I was but a babe. In my case, it was a bronze statue that proved to be my undoing. Unfortunately, they were never able to straighten out the bend in that statue, which was the result of its contact with my dome. As for the stories in the May issue, they were all perfect, every one of them. Having all the stories perfect in each issue is becoming a habit with you. Keep up this habit. For first place, I nominate When the Moon Turned Green. I consider Mr. Wells' previous story, The Gate to Zoran, the best short story you have ever printed, but the latter one surpasses it. You will not be making a mistake if you give us many more stories by this author. I do not need to say anything else about the rest of the stories. They are all excellent. Don't you think that it is about time for Astounding Stories to become a semi-monthly? Michael Forgaris, 157 4th Street, Passaic, New Jersey. Located at Last Dear Editor, 
I read every science fiction magazine on the market, and can truthfully say that yours is the best of them all. Of course, there is always room for improvement, and some of the stories published in the May issue were not so hot. Meek always gives me a pain in the neck, but Cummings is an ace, though the installment in this issue dragged considerably. In Diffin you have a master writer, and I was tickled to death to see finally in our mag a story by that peerless team, Shackner and Zagat. I was wondering how long it would take you to locate them, as you have done with most of the other stars in science fiction. Bill Miriam, Oceanfront, Venice, California. Stories aid considerably. Dear Editor, I cannot rightfully say what story was the best in Astounding Stories, for the man who balances stories for their values is just kidding himself. That is my theory, and I am ready at all times to stand in back of it. Though I have only been reading Astounding Stories since January, I am a thoroughly convinced fan. For the past two years I have been puttering with chemistry and physics in a laboratory of my own, and the science mentioned in these stories aids considerably. I would sincerely appreciate letters from readers of Astounding Stories. I will answer all. Lawrence Shoemaker, 1020 Sharon Street, Jamesville, Wisconsin. To the rescue, somebody. Dear Editor, you're getting better all the time. The April issue was the best yet, and the May issue is not far behind it. The cover on the May issue was wonderful. Dark Moon is the best story by Diffin that you have yet printed. When the Moon Turned Green and the Death Cloud are both masterpieces. The Exile of Time is a fine story, but I cannot understand the explanations. How could the murder of Major Atwood be mentioned in the records of New York? Why could not one see events in which he participated? Of course, Ray Cummings perhaps knows more about it than I, but I think a lot of his ideas are the bunk. I do not think that your stories should be full of science and nothing else, but they should at least observe known scientific facts. J. J. Johnston, Mowbray, Manitoba, Canada. A two-timer. Dear Editor, I was surprised, but pleased, to receive the answer to the question I asked in my last letter to you. It is indeed a pleasure to read a magazine that takes enough interest in its patrons to personally answer a letter written to it. Thank you very much. And I am certainly glad that we are to get a sequel to Dark Moon. I wish that I could personally tell Mr. Diffin what I think of his writing, and I am anxiously awaiting the next issue of Our Mag. It certainly does seem a long time between issues. When are you going to start putting it on the stands twice a month? I know that thousands of readers would bless the day you did it. Please keep up the good work, and I know you will, for the longer I read A.S., the more I enjoy it. The serial, The Exile of Time, is a story par excellence. But I know the forthcoming sequel to Dark Moon will be a super story. My idea of reading is that if a story is worth reading once, it is worth reading twice. And I have never seen any story in your book that was not worth reading once. Enough said. I will answer any letters written to me. I hope to hear from plenty of readers. C.G. Davis, 531 South Millard, Chicago, Illinois. And sequel it has. Dear Editor, I have just finished the May number of Astounding Stories and want to send my contribution to the Reader's Corner. The novelette Dark Moon by Diffin is rather an outstanding story in my opinion. It is plausible and convincing and the literary quality is high. I have a feeling that this should have a sequel and wonder if others will not agree with me. That Astounding Stories is the best of the science fiction magazines is something that scarcely lends itself to argument. Without questions, it leads them all. Take the present number, for instance. Diffin, Meek, and Cummings, three top-notchers, all in one issue. A.J. Harris, 1525 Bushnell Avenue, South Pasadena, California. I'm afraid not. Dear Editor, I have read every one of your astounding stories and think there is no other magazine on the market like it. Only one kick. It doesn't appear often enough. I should like to see it every week, every two weeks, anyway. I like every story you print, and I think the size of your magazine is perfect. I have saved every issue I read, and now have seventeen of them. Phalanxes of Atlans and Marooned Under the Sea were especially good. The reader's corner is fine, but I don't like so many brickbats thrown. I should like to see more bouquets given to you. There is one thing I'd like to see you print. You probably heard of the Fox movie tone picture Just Imagine, an interplanetary story of 1930. 
I'd like to see it printed in Astounding Stories more than anything else. It would make a fine serial. I don't suppose it would be possible for you to print it, though, would it? Ernestine Small, 1151 Brighton Avenue, Portland, Oregon. Better to Verse Dear Editor, Astounding Stories can't be beat. Its every issue is a treat. The finest authors of the age appear upon astounding stage. There's Diffin, Cummings, Leinster, Burks. An all-star cast, that's sure the works. Harl Vincent, Wells, and Startzel, too, belong among this famous crew. Ed Hamilton and Vic Rousseau with Captain Meek complete the show. Together, they are sure the best. That's why Astounding leads the rest. Booth Cody, Bronx, New York. Another two-timer. Dear Editor, I have just finished reading the May issue of Astounding Stories for the second time. I have been reading Astounding Stories for over a year, and so far I can find only one thing wrong with it, and that is that it is not thick enough. In other words, you do not put enough stories in it. Some people who write into the corner say that the paper is rotten. I still have all my magazines, and the paper is as good as new. The paper is also good on the eyes, as it does not reflect the light like a mirror, as some paper does. Some people say the pages are uneven and hard to turn. Like Mr. H. N. Snagger, I became so interested in the stories I do not notice such trifles. Anybody who yells about the color of the cover, the durability of the paper, is not interested in astounding stories. Why don't you either print a full-page picture at the beginning of each story, or else keep the half picture at the beginning and put another picture halfway through the story. William McCalvey, 1244 Beach Street, St. Paul, Minnesota. A Buttercup for Paul. Dear Editor, Congratulations. Astounding Stories has scored again. Not satisfied with illustrations by the mighty Wesso only, you have secured a drawing by the equally mighty Paul. May we see many more by him. Thomas L. Kratzer, 3595 Tullamore Road, Cleveland Heights, Ohio. Nerves now better? Dear Editor, in Gould you have a fine illustrator, in Wesso a better one, but as I skip the page on which the story, a truly remarkable one by R. F. Startzel, The Earthman's Burden, is on, my eye is caught by, yes, a drawing by Paul, good old reliable Mr. Paul, the king of science fiction illustrators. Now that you have him on your artist's staff, I wouldn't feel at all bad seeing a painting of his on the cover. The June issue was a dazzler. Manape the Mighty held me spellbound. The others were all excellent stories. The cover painting by Wesso was good, but I have already seen one of that sort in a previous issue. Why not give us more interplanetary illustrations of spaceships and the like, as in Brigands of the Moon? Another thing, it is 9.30. I must be asleep by 11.30 in order to start for school early the next morning. I allow myself two hours in which to read astounding stories. I turn to the content section. I see a story there which I wish to read. It's on page 604. I turn the pages 599, 601, 607, come in rapid succession, all but the page I look for. This goes on for some time until, at last, the roughened edge of 604 comes into view. By then, my nerves are on edge, and I find it is almost 11.30. But I cannot say that you do not stand up with the foremost of all magazines. And the way you are improving now, you'll soon forge far in front. Arthur Berkowitz, 763 Beck Street, New York City. Some Goal. Dear Editor, Permit me to congratulate Mr. Diffin on his latest masterpiece, Holocaust. Every once in a while, Mr. Diffin produces a story that bids fair to eclipse all its contemporaries. His former story, The Power and the Glory, could only be placed in that category. Somehow that story has become indelibly written on my memory. The philosophy expressed in it was overwhelming. It would have done justice to a Shakespeare. And now you can imagine how delighted I am to learn that Mr. Diffin has once again graced us with a yarn of the same class. Man, if you continue to publish such stories as these frequently, you'll have the public terming astounding stories, literature of the highest grade. However, I won't entreat Mr. Diffin to write these stories spasmodically, as the long week between tales adds lore to the stories. And now for Mr. Burks. Ah, here is an extraordinary chap. Mr. Burks is your most versatile author. 
of his several stories each has opened up a new vista in the field of science fiction and he is a thoroughbred in each endeavor if you want to be convinced read the opening chapters of the manope the mighty and i will wager any sum you won't lay down the story until you've read every word as a matter of fact all the stories are good and the bill for next month appears to be exceptionally unusual it is very evident that you are on the road to perfection smooth cut edges the acquisition of the greatest of artists paul all point to the accelerating progress astounding stories is achieving we readers are frequently asked as to how we would run the magazine if we were editors well here is my conception of the ideal magazine smooth paper no advertisements whatsoever the interior illustrations done by an artist with the talent of a paul and a wesso combined and made in watercolors too then i would only have such renowned authors as burroughs mcisaac and a few others i suppose that's the eternal dream of the modern editor but who can say that you mr bates won't evolve astounding stories in the same manner at any rate there's a goal to aim for mortimer weisinger two sixty six van de cortland avenue bronx new york guilty dear editor you are hereby summoned to appear in court on attempt of murder following other charges stopping my heart from beating when i saw the smooth edges in astounding stories and making my heart miss five beats when i saw the earthman's burden illustrated by paul i now think astounding stories has reached its highest peak arthur j burke's story was a wow i hope he works on a story as he said he would in the reader's corner if he gets enough requests and charles willard diffin here's a writer for you I think the first story he has ever wrote was published in Astounding Stories. Don't lose him. His Holocaust is his best, with the probable exception of the power and the glory. I don't think the last mentioned ever got enough praise. I expect to see it reprinted some day in the Golden Book magazine, its distinctly smooth paper style. And, of course, Sewell Peasley Wright's John Hansen stories are top-notchers. And Ray Cummings, must be mentioned his story, we all know what to expect when we read one of his stories. I hope you have another serial by him soon. I'm sure you'll be deluged with letters because of the even edges and the illustrations by Paul, who should draw at least two in every issue. But I hope you'll print my letter because I never had a letter of mine in print, and I want to get a thrill seeing this published. Anthony Caserta, 4575 Park Avenue, New York, New York. End of chapter 17《the letters by P. Schuyler, J. N. Mosler, and Jackson Gee in the last number sure do raise some very neat possibilities in science. Anent travel in time. Just what would you, Mr. Schuyler, expect to see if John Doe at 40 years in 1931 went back to 1892 and met John Doe of that date on Main Street of his old hometown? I suspect that two bodies cannot simultaneously contain the same ego, constant entity, personality, or soul. Which brings me to Mr. Moslet to ask, just how is the self-realizant ego, which is conscious that I am I unchangingly for life, in any sense a derivative of the unstoppable, rapidly changing body? Mr. Burks and Mr. Lee elucidate a very pretty little problem on the same lines. The cranial transplantation and the atomic patterns are admittedly scientifically and reasonably possible, but there is a real point of doubt. Would the personality accompany the brain in transplantation? True, the brain is the control room, but... And would the atomic patterns, perfectly as they could duplicate a body which is unstable by nature, work on the essential stable ego, relatively, with its inherent capacity for continuity. 
If not, would not the synthetic extra man be a human being minus personality? Some very pretty problems here. I'd much like to see a story along the lines of item three in Mr. Burke's letter. L. Partridge, Box 84, Cornish, Maine. What Price Smoothness? Dear Editor, I have just finished the June issue of Astounding Stories. The cover was excellent, as were all the illustrations, except perhaps Manape's arms. Should have been a little larger. I see that the edges of the paper are now smooth, but still leaves stick out beyond one another, so what good does that do? Manape the Mighty, by Arthur J. Burks, was superb, gripping. I suppose a lot of readers will rise violently against the love interest, but I ask you, just where would this particular story be without the romance in it? This particular story, you understand, not every story. Holocaust by Charles Willard Diffin was next best with The Man from 2071, a close second. The Earthman's Burden was at least entertaining, which this installment of The Exile of Time was not. Robert Baldwin, 359, he's 11, you Highland Park, Illinois. Time Trouble Answers Wanted Dear Editor, I have read your magazine for nearly two years, but this is my first letter to the corner. The first and second installments of Ray Cummings' Exile of Time prompted me to write this. There is a story you can well be proud of. I should like to obtain it in book form. Mr. Cummings is a wonder. I have read many time stories, but this is at the top of my list. If there is any other time fans in A.S.'s Reader's Corner, I should like to have a letter discussion on it with him. None of my acquaintances care a whoop about that type of story, so I have to thrash out all my problems by myself. There are some questions I would like to ask about the exile of time. 1. In the event of the appearance of a time-traveling cage, the story ran, to use Ray's own words, suddenly before me there was a white ghost, a shape, a wraith of something which a moment before had not been there. The shape was like a mist, then in a second or two it was solid. Why should the cage appear as a mist at first? If there is any amount of time separating two things, those two things are invisible to each other, are they not? Any amount of time would include a second, and even a millionth part of a second. In that case, the cage should suddenly appear in the twinkling of an eye, with no trace of a blur. 2. Supposing I were standing at a spot five feet from a time-traveling vehicle. The latter would be traveling through time at 3 p.m. while I am at 2 p.m., an hour's difference between us. It would be invisible to me then, but an hour later, when I would be at 3 p.m. and the machine at 4 p.m., then I would see it as it appeared at 3 p.m. Whatever movement it would make in space, I would not see until an hour later. Is that right? Then is it not possible that each individual is existing in a different time realm. And we see them, or I see the other fellow as he appeared when my time caught up with his. I had better quit before I get hooted off the stage. 3. If a man invented a time traveler and went back to the year of the beginning of the World War, knowing all he has read in history, could he not take steps to prevent a war that has already happened? Or would that power be denied him? Somewhere in the story is said that the past cannot be changed, and that any effort to do so would be useless. In my belief, no matter where or when a man goes into the past, if he appears in a year or day that has already gone by, he is changing the past. Then there should be no room for doubt. Time traveling is impossible. It never will be done. An astounding stories fan should be kicked for using the word impossible. Let's have more good, thought-provoking time tales, and get lots of stories from Cummings. He's a wow. I sure would like to spend an evening at a campfire with him. Alan Spoolman, 613 Fourth Avenue, West Ashland, Wisconsin. Eh, what? Dear Editor, Just got my June issue of our good mag, Astounding Stories, and I think it is great. One thing you should do, however, is have a more mechanical cover design. In regard to Miss Gertrude Henkin's letter in the June issue of A.S., let me say that I just wonder what she would like to expect in our reader's corner if she does not like to hear what others think of our astounding stories. Maybe she would like to read about checker debates or the like. Eh, what? 
If Rex Wirtz of Oregon, who is now located somewhere in Los Angeles, will drop me a line, perhaps we can become acquainted as he suggested. Edward Anderson, 123 Hollister Ave, Ocean Park, California. Hope he does. Dear Editor, I have never been interested before in a magazine enough to write to their departments like the Reader's Corner, and I have read plenty of magazines. Beyond the Vanishing Point stands head and shoulders above any story I have ever read. I have only one thing to say about your other stories. They are almost as good as the one I just mentioned. I have a few words to say about these people who throw brickbats at every story they read. I wouldn't be surprised if they just read the story so they could find something wrong with it. There's one in particular who wrote a few lines in the June issue about your taking the word science off the front page, saying there was no science in the magazine anyway. What does the title say? Well, that's what 90% of the readers want, anyway. I hope that chap reads this. Well, I'll sign off. Here is a little toast to the magazine. Long may it live. Earl Rogers, 409, 16th Street, Galveston, Texas. Two better than one? Dear Editor, the two outstanding stories in the May issue of A.S. were The Death Cloud by Nat Schachner and Arthur L. Zagat, and Dark Moon by Charles W. Diffin. Common reasoning tells me that the heads of two science fiction writers can formulate a story better than one. I couldn't help admire Mr. Shackner and Mr. Zagat when I read their story because of the cleverness shown in it. Please give us a story by them every month. Ray Y. Tilford, Rockport, Kentucky. And here I am. Dear Editor, it's about time for me to concede that your or our magazine is the best I have read. Ten issues have come into my hands, and I am perfectly well satisfied with the line of fiction that you publish. I have read about fifty different magazines on the market, and I am sure that Astounding Stories is the best of them all. I have followed the magazine for seven months, and that is the best amount of reading any magazine can boast for me. In your case, if the magazine lasts seventy years, you can be sure that I will read it for that period of time, provided I live that long. I notice that several brickbats have come into your hands and that you have printed them. Well, that shows sportsmanship on your part. I would suggest to those who are not satisfied with astounding stories to duck their head in a pail of water and pull it out after a period of ten minutes. Those who criticize the stories because of the lack of science have no idea what it takes to write a story. Please be willing to concede the author the right of way. He is giving his theories and not yours. However, in some cases where the truth is an established fact, I can see where the readers may present a justified argument. But they should remember that we are not all perfect and that mistakes are made by all. It is not fair to criticize an author by denouncing him. I don't favor reprints at all, but I can stay with the majority if they do. It is a foregone conclusion that you can fool some of the people some of the time, but you can't fool all of the people all the time. In this case... Substitute the word please in the saying for fool. I am at present reading Charles W. Diffin's novel, The Pirate Planet. It is one of the best interplanetary novels that I have ever read. Give us some more of Diffin. He has the goods. I must say that you have an immensely long list of popular authors, and it must cost quite a little amount of money to maintain them. Keep the size of the magazine as it is now, if it fits conveniently into my bookcase, and I believe many of your readers will say the same. Now some of my favorite stories. The Ape Man of Zlati was one of the best stories that I have read in years. Give us some more along this line. It offers rest after one has just finished reading an interplanetary novel. Monsters of Moyen was another story that I greatly enjoyed. Very few people believe that the world shall ever have a conqueror again, and I am one of them. But it is interesting to see if there ever will be a conqueror, and what means he shall employ to get that title. Brigands of the Moon was the worst story I read in your magazine. That must have been Mr. Cummings' off story. But he certainly has come back fine through his later stories. The Tentacles from Below was another great masterpiece. Anthony Gilmore's tale was the first time I have read of that author, and I will be delighted to see more. Funny how I developed into a reader of science fiction. I exhausted all other fields of reading, and having nothing else to read, I delved into a science magazine, and here I am. Michael Riccano, 51 Brookwood Street, East Orange, New Jersey. Turns it to first. Dear Editor, the June issue of Astounding Stories can't be beat. What an issue. As it seems to be the usual thing, I'll start at the front and go to the back. 
The cover, very colorful. Another proof of Wesso's talent, and speaking of artists, I was very pleasantly surprised at the unexpected illustration by Paul. I certainly hope you can get him, if not for cover pictures, at least for the inside illustrations. Too bad you are modest about printing complimentary letters, for I mean this to be all roses, no brickbats. The Man from 2071, another good story of John Hansen's. Man Ape the Mighty, although somewhat like the Tarzan series, is a wonderfully fine story. Holocaust, good. The Earthman's Burden, as of all of Startles, was exceptionally good. The Exile of Time, getting better every issue. The Reader's Corner, as usual, was one of the most interesting parts of the magazine. I always turn to it first, for I know I will have an enjoyable time reading every letter. And by the way, the significance of Manape just came to me. Don't know why I didn't see it before. Linus Hagenmiller, 502 North Washington Street, Farmington, Missouri. Likes the joke. Dear Editor, Although I have read only two issues of Astounding Stories, I feel the urge to write a line. The June number was better than the May issue. Arthur J. Burke's story, Manape the Mighty, was excellent, though I am not so strong for the idea of having Barter escape the apes and carry on his experiments as suggested by the author. It would be against common sense to have the apes allow him to make a getaway. The prize winner in the May issue was Dark Moon. There might be a sequel to that, and I'd like to see it. I like a little variety in a magazine. The readers who say they do not care for stories scientifically impossible may be right. In that case, The Exile of Time is the greatest joke ever written. Yet I like it immensely. One thing that is impossible is the destruction of matter. It can be broken up or condensed, as in When Caverns Yawned, but not destroyed completely. Mr. W. H. Flowers evidently has a grudge against the fair sex. The love interest is not necessary in short stories, it's true. But what kind of a long novel would it be if the hero had no incentive, nothing to risk his life for except a possible word of praise from the scientific world? No matter how much a man loves his work, it is my opinion that he would not die for the purpose of proving his point. Not being able to take a hint, the knockers still appear to mar an otherwise perfect day, this time in the person of Harry Pancoast. If astounding stories ever get so bad that not even one story in it is of interest to me, I'll just drop out of the waiting line and keep my mouth closed. Richard Waite, 8 South Avenue, Wausau, New York. Never noticed that. Dear Editor, Just bought my latest copy of Astounding Stories, and what an edition. First, the cover. Wesso has all others beat by a mile. Then the stories. Well, take Manape the Mighty. It is one of the best science fiction stories I have ever read. The Exile of Time was great. Have you ever noticed that almost every critic of science fiction is either a teacher or a female? Jim Nicholson and I certainly know that. Billy Roach, Secretary, Interplanetary Department of the BSB 101 St. Elmo, San Francisco, California. Sunflowers for All Dear Editor, Miracles do happen. I was never so thoroughly astounded in all my life as when I received the great June issue of our magazine with straight edges. Thank you all concerned for publishing our magazine sans rough edges. The smooth edges ought to cut the reading time of Astounding Stories down to an hour and forty-five minutes as we always used to waste a lot of time fumbling about with the pages. But if I was astounded at the long-awaited straight edges, I was still more amazed at the great innovation of an illustration by Paul. Let's have more and more of his remarkable drawings. Astounding Stories is truly great, now with its fine editor, splendid authors, excellent stories, worthy illustrations, essential reader's corner, Paul, ah, and good binding. Yes, you heard right, I said good binding. Of course it makes amusing a material to write about the binding, and remark that it comes off after one's handling it, or that the paper is soon worn to shreds, but such matters shouldn't be honestly believed. I have every issue of Astounding Stories, eighteen great numbers, and each and every issue is as good as new. I never had any trouble with the covers departing from the rest of the magazine, or the pages becoming moldy. Sewell Peasley writes, the man from 2071 is just perfect. 
I enjoy nothing more than one of his realistic stories of Commander John Hansen. We want more. Author J. Burke's novelette, Manape the Mighty, was clever. I had a premonition that I wouldn't like the story, and in fact told a friend so. It just goes to prove that hunches can be wrong. Charles Wilfred Diffin should be proud of his Holocaust. I'm sure that most readers enjoyed it as much as I did. Of course, Startle's The Earth Man's Burden was a peach. His stories of other planets are always weird, bizarre, and yet they seem to ring true. That is the magic of R. F. Startle. Paul illustrated it in his own unapproachable style. The Exile of Time, as everyone agrees, is Cummings' best. I am waiting for its thrilling conclusion. I am one who would like Astounding Stories to be a large-sized magazine, but it can easily be seen that everyone can't be pleased. If you'll just leave it the way it is, that is, straight edges, illustrations by Paul, same authors and same excellent editor, I'll be satisfied. Forrest J. Ackerman, 530 Staples Avenue, San Francisco, California. Great relief. Dear Editor, the story Manape the Mighty by author J. Burks was by far one of the most thrilling and educational stories that ever appeared in Astounding Stories. Of course, others will disagree, but an author cannot please all. It is of great relief to change from the monotonous, everyday kind of stories that appear in Collier's, Liberty, and the Saturday Evening Post to the refreshing and soothing, impossible type of Astounding Stories. Ever since the January issue, I have been an ardent pursuer of Astounding Stories. To me, it is even more astounding that I seem to like it more and more each succeeding issue. I find it undoubtedly the best magazine of its type. I've tried others of similar type, but it seems as if my mind couldn't grasp the knack of the stories, which were either boresome with scientific and technical explanations, or, as one might say, not a darn thing to them. R. F. Startle is a wonderful author. Ray Cummings, Sewell Peasley Wright, Charles Woolard Diffin, Captain S. P. Meek, Edmund Hamilton, F. V. W. Mason, and Mary Leinster are excellent. There is one thing that I'd like to see in Astounding Stories, and I'm sure many of the readers would too. It is always my habit to read while eating. To finish the story in time, I pick the shortest one. Sad to say, Astounding has rather long stories. How about an occasional short story? I'm sure you readers will approve. That would go over with a bang. P. Nikolaev, 4325 S. Sealy Avenue, Chicago, Illinois. Sometimes gets mad. Dear Editor, although I have been an interested reader of Astounding Stories since its inception, this is the first time I have written. Astounding Stories has been so good lately that I just had to write and compliment you on your good work. There are, however, some criticisms I have to make. The first is, I think Mr. W. H. Flowers of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania is right when he says, you sometimes have too much love in some of your stories. The second is, I think it would be a good thing to put notes at the end of a page to explain some of the terms for the readers, who read mostly for the science part. That is what I do, and I get mad. When I read something that does not give me the inside dope on it, outside of that I think astounding stories can't be beat. One more thing before I close. Keep Captain S.P. Meek on your staff, or I will stop reading astounding stories. As much as I would hate to do that, I think he is your best author by a long shot. Wilson Adams, Seat Pleasant, Maryland. From a female woman. Dear Editor, The comment of Jim Nicholson in the June issue, that it is only the females who consider him cracked for reading science fiction, and only women who do not care for science in the stories, moves me to break into the reader's corner for the first time. I happen to be a, quote, female woman, unquote. and it is the men in our family and circle of friends who laugh at me for buying every science fiction magazine and book that I can find. They call them my nutty magazines. I have to admit that I do not understand much of the scientific explanation, since my mind does not run along mathematical or scientific lines. But I do not mind having that in stories for those who do care for it and can understand it, as I can simply skip over it, taking what I can grasp and letting the rest go. 
It doesn't spoil the story for me. I have no criticism, constructive or otherwise, to make. I enjoy the stories with the romance involved and enjoy those without equally well. My own preference would be that you continue using rough paper and your present mechanical construction so that more money will be available to pay for the stories. Few of us keep the magazines anyway, so there isn't so much need for expensive paper. I like interplanetary stories best, I think. But I was intensely interested in Beyond the Vanishing Point, Man Ape the Mighty, and Holocaust. All different, but all very good. I can't remember one I did not like. My work requires much study and concentration. I have recommended to several men who do similar mental work that they follow my plan of securing delightful relaxation by losing themselves in another world through science fiction magazines. Most of them find it as restful as I do. Bernice M. Harrison, Angola, Indiana. Like Sir F. Startzel. Dear Editor, It has been my purpose to write to you before, but due to an extraordinary amount of detail work which I have had to do, I have been unable to. I have read your marvelous magazine ever since the first issue came into my hands, and I can honestly say that there is no other book on the market which has held my attention as long as yours has. I congratulate you on your very interesting magazine. Arthur J. Burks, in his latest story, has conceived an entirely new type of story, and I, for one, think it is very interesting. Plenty of science for the layman and enough interest for the others. I liked R. F. Startzel's story, The Earthman's Burden, very much, and I hope you will have more by this author soon. His stories are perfect. Startzel is a deep thinker, and I am right here to say that there is a man who understands men, and men's longings and inhibitions. E. W. Gowing, 17 Pasadena Street, Springfield, Mass. The Reader's Corner. All readers are extended a sincere and cordial invitation to come over in the Reader's Corner and join in our monthly discussion of stories, authors, scientific principles and possibilities, everything that's of common interest in connection with our astounding stories. Although from time to time the editor may make a comment or so, this is a department primarily for readers, and we want you to make full use of it. Likes, dislikes, criticisms, explanations, roses, brickbats, suggestions. Everything's welcome here. So come over in the reader's corner and discuss it with all of us. The Editor End of Section 18《Section 19 of Astounding Stories 20, August 1931. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. — Astounding Stories 20, August 1931 by Captain S. P. Meek. Chapter 19. A Living Disembodied Heart. A disembodied heart, not only still beating, but writing as it throbbed a permanent, minutely precise record of its pulsations, was exhibited recently at Princeton in a demonstration of the newest instrument developed by science for the advancement of medicine and psychology. The device, invented by A. L. Loomis of Tuxedo Park, New York, and perfected in collaboration with Dr. Edmund N. Harvey, professor of psychology at Princeton University, is called the Loomis Chronograph. It will facilitate study of the phenomenon of heart action and the effect of drugs on that vital organ. The chronograph opens the way to the accurate measuring and recording of the speed and variation of human heartbeats over long periods, even during the sleeping hours of the subject, which is expected to prove of great value to physiologists and criminologists. The heart of the recent demonstration was that of a turtle, removed from the reptile while alive, freed of all extraneous tissue, and suspended in a physiological salt solution exactly duplicating body conditions. 
In this state, the organ continues to beat for 36 hours, at the same time setting down, by means of the chronograph, a graphic history of the approximately 72,000 pulsations it makes in that time. With each beat, the tiny organism pulled down into a little lever that dipped a fine filament into a drop of mercury and made a contact that transmitted an electric impulse to the chronograph. There it was translated to a fraction of a second into a record inked on a chart. Introduction into the solution of nicotine, one part of ten thousand, and of adrenaline, one part in a billion, was immediately noted by a marked retarding of the heart tempo in the first case, and swift acceleration in the second. Use of the chronograph to study the action of any heart that can be removed from the living body is possible, the scientist said, adding that a comparatively simple adjustment will make possible recording of the human heart by a device applied to the chest. Application of the instrument to tests of human nerve reactions and to psychological tests is forecast. End of section 19. End of Astounding Stories 20, August 1931.